All right, all right, thank you for joining me on this episode of The Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Marlon Wilson, and we have another fantastic debate for you. It has been about a week or two since last time I jumped on with a debate. Thank you for holding strong, thank you for being patient, for bringing another debate to you. I am so excited to be before you. And I have Dr. Michael Brown, I have Corey Miner with me, and today they're gonna to be debating once saved, always saved, is it biblical? And we're gonna have a fantastic discussion. But before I bring those guys in, just make sure you know to subscribe and hit that notification bell on the Gospel Truth. If you enjoy debates, interviews, and commentaries, this is the place you want to subscribe to, so make sure you do that now before you forget. Also, all this content, well, different types of the same content is on different platforms. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok as well. So flow over to those platforms to support the ministry. You want to subscribe, a like over there as well. Also, all this content is on podcasts on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. I think it's shutting down, so I may have to find an alternative podcasting platform for Stitcher. So you guys, if you're on Stitcher, you guys might want to unsubscribe on Stitcher because they are shutting down their pot, their platform. So I'll be adjusting that and putting another one up there. But for now, it is on Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. So make sure you subscribe over there. All right, all this content is. Not alone, right? Uh, there's more shows that are coming up here in the future that I want you guys to be aware of, all right? Let me pull this up. All right, so next up, I have uh, Chris Claus and Andrew Griffin. They're gonna be jumping on, and they're gonna be debating Jesus Christ pre-existence, and that is coming up uh, soon. Philippians chapter 2, 6-11, six, six to 11, and Hebrews 1 will be of subject. So if this is your type of debate, make sure you go ahead and jump on to this one, all right? After that, another great debate, predestination, eternal security. Always an exciting topic. This should be a fun one. Uh, these two are, no, I don't think they're newcomers. I think uh, I think they may be newcomers to the God's truth. So we're looking forward to this debate. If you like this type of topic, make sure you subscribe and hit that bell on this topic. All right, I have Dr. Michael Burgos and Brandon Nero. Is Je Jesus is the father. That is the question of that debate. And so I'm looking forward to this one and uh, pretty excited for it. After that, I have another one. Jesus is the only God. Uh, so this is going to be a fantastic debate. Both of these guys are newcomers on the gospel truth. So hope you're looking forward to this one. 
And lastly, we are doing a media equipment uh, fundraiser. So make sure if the guy puts it on your heart to support the ministry with some funds for the media equipment, please do that. We are building funds to buy media equipment to take on the road, uh, to do debates and interviews and so forth on and any venue possible, right? Uh, if it's a venue that has no, no, no high quality media equipment, we want to be able to supply that on our own and not be able to rely on different venues for that, right? Uh, so if you feel that God's pulling your heart to do so, please support the ministry and if you're interested, the, uh, the link to the media fundraiser uh, uh, page or web page is in the description of this video. All right, that said, let me bring these guys in so they can introduce themselves. You guys remember Dr. Michael Brown? He's been on a couple times. I brought him on when the guys who was first starting up, Dr. Michael Brown made an appearance and we talked about response to, Ju uh, to to Israel, to Jews, right? We talked about his two, he has, I think he has two or three volumes of that particular topic matter. So we talk, talked about that. Also, uh, you remember Corey Miner? He's been on, most recently he'd been on, we, we're discussing uh, those heretics out there, those prosperity gospel individuals, those guys out there speaking nonsense, speaking nonsense, false gospel. And we he had on, we had a fantastic discussion. And so let me bring these guys in so they can further introduce themselves to you. How you doing, guys? Doing wonderful. Doing great, thanks. All right, glad to have you guys on. Once again, Dr. Michael Brown. Pleasure, Corey, pleasure. I'm excited for this one. This is one I've been looking forward to. This topic is a hot topic, man. Uh, once saved, always saved. It sort of hits the heart of, almost the heart of salvation here. You know what I mean? A little bit there. So uh, this is going to be a fun discussion. I did watch you guys' previous discussion. I think you guys had it on Corey. I think it was on Corey's channel. You guys previously just recently had a discussion, I think about a month ago now, concerning the gifts, right? The charismatic gifts or something like that. And uh, I found that discussion very good, very, very, very good and very informative so i expect the same thing today uh without further ado i'm going to allow you guys to introduce yourselves to the audience so they can get to know you let them know youtube channel blogs website ministries whatever you guys do let them know so they can come check you out all right dr michael brown if you don't mind go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself sure thing folks can find me at ask dr brown ministries.org ask dr brown dot or excuse me s dr brown dot org or the app Ask Dr. Brown Ministries. I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus, saved in 1971. And the three emphases of our ministry, revival in the church, gospel-based moral and cultural revolution, and redemption of Israel, seeing Jewish people saved. Got my daily radio broadcast, The Line of Fire, which we also air on our Facebook and YouTube channels, which are also Ask Dr. Brown, ASK Dr. Brown. I normally write about five op-eds a week on what's happening in the culture around us from a biblical perspective. And got a bunch of books out there. By the way, it's actually five volumes on answering Jewish objections for Jesus. But thanks for knowing uh, that a few of them exist. And I love God, love the word, and love having healthy discussions with my brothers about the word. Looking forward to tonight. All right. All right. Thank you, Dr. Brown, once again for coming on. All right, Corey, you up next. Go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself. Uh, well, my name is Corey Miner, and I do host a channel, Smart Christians Channel, uh, as well as you'll also be able to catch the content on uh, smartchristians.org within, I guess, I think two days, in, in two days. Um, and the whole purpose of what we do and even outside the outside of ministry is to promote a love for the word. And so our motto is uh, love it, learn it and live it. And so that being said, that's pretty much all I have. Not as not as distinguished as uh, Dr. Brown been saved since 1991 uh, and trying to get better at this. All right. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Hey, Corey, people in the chat making fun of your your camera, man. Uh, you, you got the one eye camera going on. So you need to get center frame in, in the frame a little bit, man. That's all. Okay. That's all. People, okay. People, people, people cracking jokes. <laughs> let me let me go. Let me go fix this. Then give me give me one second. <laughs> oh, you good. You good, uh, man. People, people got jokes, man. No worries. Matter of fact, let me just slide over. How about that? There you go. That's all you had to do. That's what I was telling you, man. Don't mess with that computer at all, man. Just yeah, slide not, over. All I'm right. So you guys. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly good stuff guys all right so once again the topic of this debate is once saved always is once saved always saved biblical core you arguing the affirmative dr michael brown you're arguing the negative and so we're going to start off with 10 minute opening statements and then we're going to follow that with five minute rebuttals then we're going to have a 40 minute cross x both of you will get 20 minutes each to ask questions and we're going to follow that with five minute closings and then we have about a 30 minute q a from the audience sounds good mm-hmm all right, Corey, you are up first for your 10-minute opening. 
and let me get your time up Corey, before you go for it let me where am i 10 minute at all right there it is will will i be able to see the timer or yes if you look on the if you look on the screen that we're all on or right now it'd be just you on there you'll see the, the you should see the the clock in your upper left hand corner and also you remember know. you'll you'll hear this little chime right there that'll let you know that you have one minute left in your in your presentation no i don't i don't i don't see it but i guess it's okay i'll i'll be fine i think i'll be fine i'll try to be fine <laughs> we'll see uh, yeah you well, should see it there. now okay no you know what i see I, there it is that yeah. picture of me was there okay i'm good now okay um i will not need all 10 minutes but let me just say this and irrespective of which side you fall on whether you believe in uh one saved always saved or you believe in loss of salvation obviously we understand that there are different ways you can put it and when we say loss of salvation uh you hear the little cute little sayings and so forth like losing your keys and so forth but we all know we're talking about a person being saved today and then in a day in a week in a month in a year through sin or what have you, that person not being saved. And so this is what we're talking about. And so I believe that the Bible gives us a clear description of what a Christian is. The Bible also gives us a clear description of what a Christian is not. The Bible tells us what a, a believer is and describes what an unbeliever is also. The Bible even gives a description of what a false convert convert is. Uh, those who, that is those who may look outwardly like a Christian, those who may at case in times behave like a Christian, but are not. The Bible takes its time, gives effort to telling us, describing to us what a believer is. I believe, uh, which is why, by the way, the Bible warns us to examine ourselves. That is for those who are true believers, but also more importantly, for those who are false converts, those who think they are. The Bible has different examples of people who such as in Luke, we may cover that, who believe for a moment, Paul tells everyone to examine themselves. Jesus makes a similar statement. And so that's the reason for you having these warning passages. I think people like Dr. Brown and others kind of conflate and confuse the passages that warn and call us to examine ourselves with being passages that state that a person can lose their salvations. They make these out to be passages that say that a Christian can one day become a non-Christian. Just like we don't confuse a man who wants to be a woman, no matter what he puts on, no matter how he looks outwardly. There have been some who have had some amazing surgeries and for some have been able to fool others, but we know inwardly, and at least God knows that they are not women. Similarly, we've got the same thing that happens with people who want to call themselves Christians. As a matter of fact, uh, even in looking at any sort of study or research, there are more and more people why well, actually less and less who call themselves Christian, but even still we recognize that all of those who call themselves Christians are not, not everyone who says to him, Lord, Lord, they actually are. And so God throughout the Bible has wanted to reconcile man to himself. He has wanted to bring about a relationship with man and himself and to deal with sin. And the way God has done so is he has dealt with the heart that is his way of doing so. And so he's done so by providing a remedy for sin. In other words, a debt to be paid to the Father and then by us placing our faith in him and then that debt being canceled, he then gives us the Holy Spirit. The debt is paid for, the Holy Spirit is in us, and so now we are considered to be him. And so upon placing faith, all of us, anyone placing their faith in Christ, every believer has been given the Holy Spirit. And because of that, if a person were to say that they could place their faith in Christ, be atoned for, meaning no more debt owed, having received the Holy Spirit, and then sometime thereafter, no longer be atoned for, no longer be in right standing, no longer have the Holy Spirit. To me, that would mean that what Jesus literally did on the cross was a waste of time, waste of sacrifice, and waste of blood. So then passages such as Jude 24 and 25 says, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, he doesn't. I can keep you from falling, but I won't. And so that's why I think that we 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 missed the, the whole point of why we have these scriptures and why Christ went to the cross. And so with that being the case, I don't require uh, the extra six more minutes. And so I'll go ahead and relinquish it back to you. All right. Thank you so much, Corey. Appreciate that. All right, Dr. Michael Brown, you're up for your 10 minute opening. 
and I will let me stop your time and I'll start your time as soon as you begin to speak. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to uh, share a lot of scripture with you and, and we'll let the scriptures really speak for themselves. I want to say first that as a follower of Jesus, I rest secure in his atoning work and his death and resurrection and God's keeping power. I never worry about, quote, losing my salvation or forfeiting my salvation. I know John 10, that no one can pluck me out of the Father's hand. I know uh, Romans 8, 32 to 39, that nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. I know Philippians 1, 6, that he who began the good work will bring it to completion. So the faithfulness of God is absolutely clear. It's also clear that he does not force his children to stay in his house. And if someone wants to leave, wants to abandon him, wants to turn their backs on him, they are able to do that, and he will not stop us. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13, here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we, speaking of us as believers, if we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. So even if we deny his existence, he still exists. But if we disown him, he will disown us. Listen to the end of James 5, verses 19 and 20. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, so this is speaking to a believer, bring them back. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. So this person could go back in their sin and suffer death for it and be judged by God. Yet if you bring them back, their sins will be freshly forgiven. Listen to this warning about the effects of false teachers in 2 Peter 2, 19 to 22. They promise them freedom, meaning they're hearers, while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Now look at this. If they, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that's speaking of a believer, and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. Now, if you came to know Jesus, turned away, and then as a result of it, were just stricken with premature death, it's still better that you knew him because once they've always saved, it's true, you'll be with him forever anyway. But no, this says it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, which is also referred to here as knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and escaping the corruption of the world through him, right? If you go back, it's even worse. It's like the, the dog returning to its vomit. A sow that was washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Second Peter 3, 17 and 18, Therefore, dear friends, since you've been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. Hebrews 2, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? And the verses that follow speak of us coming to know the Lord through his word. Hebrews 3, notice who's being addressed in verses 12 through 14. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. And Paul says the same thing in Colossians 1, 21 to 23. This is not a matter of who's a true believer or not. Look at what he says. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. These are saved people. If, if, if you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Hebrews 4.1, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you found to have fallen short of it. Hebrews 10 is even more explicit. I want you to listen to this language carefully. Hebrews says, if we deliberately keep on sinning, verses 26 to 31, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. 
how much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him? This is someone who has been sanctified by the blood and who has insulted the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So this is someone explicitly who has been sanctified by the blood of Son of God, the Son of God, but then continues in willful, deliberate, unrepentant sin. All of us fall short every day. All of us receive mercy every day. All of us receive cleansing by the blood of Jesus every day if we're believers. Even as we walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7 still says that, that we sin because we're not perfect, so we receive forgiveness. But those who willfully turn away from the Lord, who willfully turn away from the light, who willfully refuse his grace, who willfully choose sin and refuse to repent, who deny Jesus as Lord, they will forfeit their salvation. Hence this warning at the end of Hebrews 12. See to it, again, writing to believers, that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we, if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, we believers, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Look at what Jesus says in Revelation 3, verse 5 to the church in Sardis. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. It is possible to have our name blotted out as believers. Again, it's not save one minute, lost the next minute, save one minute, lost a minute, but it's surely as we receive salvation by grace, we can reject that grace, we can despise that grace, we can turn from that grace. Galatians 5 addresses this explicitly. And Paul speaks of these people in the third chapter as people who had received the Lord, who had seen his miracles, who had received the Holy Spirit. These were people, according to Paul in Galatians 3, who had already received the Holy Spirit. What does he write in the fifth chapter, beginning verse 2? Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Well, if you still make it into heaven, he's of value to you. If he's of no value to you, you're lost. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. And to the Ephesians, he writes this. Remember Ephesians 1, he says, you have received the deposit of the Holy Spirit. He says, but there must not be among you even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. These warnings are also found in Galatians 5. They're found in 1 Corinthians 6. They're found in Colossians 3. All warnings to believers saying, do not live certain ways in the flesh in the world because judgment is coming on those who do. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Therefore, put these things to death in your own life. Uh, it is essential that we understand these biblical truths. If someone says, well, we can't really know who's saved until the end, well, then that's one mentality. But if we agree that we can know that we're born again, that we can have the witness of the spirit, the assurance of the new life, and the evidence of a transformed life, as the people did to whom these letters are being written, if we can say that we can absolutely know for sure that we are saved today, as I would say for sure, I know my own life and hopefully my other brothers here would save their own lives, then either these words are true and these warnings are relevant and we should take them to heart, or these words are not true and these warnings are not relevant because if you know that you know that you're saved, then you know it's impossible for you to forfeit your salvation, in which case every scripture I just read is null and void. So I think it's best to just let the word speak for itself. These are clear warnings all from the New Testament, all written to believers, and in many cases with explicit language, speaking of how they had relationship with the Lord, had the Holy Spirit, 
sanctified by the blood of Jesus, and yet there's a very real warning that they could forfeit their salvation. I think the word speaks pretty clearly. All right. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for that opening. All right, Corey, you're back in the seat for your five-minute rebuttal. Let me get this time out of the way. All right. Uh, and I'll start your time as soon as you begin to speak, Corey. Every single passage that he read would be null and void if it's read out of context, which he did. Because he did exactly what I said ends up happening. We end up conflating and confusing passages that warn us. Think about this. You know someone who attends church, someone who says they're a Christian and they are not because of how they evidently live. At least it seems that way. What would you do if you love that person? You would warn them. Well, guess what? So does the Bible. That's why when he reads a chapter, a book like James 519, he says, and notice the writing, he says, if any of you among us, the Greek, the word among us is there, and it didn't need to be there. You could just say, if any of you, if any among us were to depart, even when he reads 2 Peter 2, 20, he misses what he's saying. By the way, it says, escape the defilements of the world by the knowledge. We all can know it, knowing what Christ has done, and then even believing it, but not internalizing me. And I mean, by believing, having mental ascent, that can be done with anyone. But notice also, every time that we read these passages, or even the ones that he reads, surrounded by all of those are passages that will tell us, that will confirm that faith in Christ is what saves us. Now, when, do, when is a person saved? According to Jesus in John 6, 47, that when a person believes at that moment, he has eternal life. John 6, 47, the moment you believe, if you are believing one at that moment, and you have to notice the tense of the verb, present active participle, this means that the person is in a state of believing, that person at that moment, according to Jesus, has life into the ages. If Jesus wanted us to believe that that believing person has life until, then he would have stated so. But we cannot find, as a matter of fact, we don't have a scripture that anyone can point to where there's someone who was a believer definitively, meaning we know for a fact they were a believer, and then we also know for a fact that they're not a believer. You could pick Judas, you could pick Demas, you could pick Hymenaeus, you can pick Alexander, you can pick uh, Ananias and Sapphira. We don't have not one. But the Bible tells us again, this is the issue. Is there a debt that is owed? If you run to Hebrews, remember in Hebrews 8, he tells us this is the point of all that he's saying and he tries to nail home the fact that you cannot lose your salvation. Why does he say so? By the way, if someone like Dr. Brown or anyone else would say that you can, well, fine. If you believe you can, the writer of Hebrews 6 tells us that it is impossible for you to get it back. And I know that Dr. Brown is not stating that a person who loses their salvation can then get it back. But the writer of Hebrews 6 says clearly that it is impossible for that person to get it back. He gave a sacrifice one for all. Remember, in, in Hebrews, writing to these Jewish believers, and I agree, these are believers, but he's telling them, he's comforting them because they understand full well how the atonement works. Once you have been atoned for, now, of course, in their in their system, one it, it was done once for a year. However, as the writer of Hebrews says, we don't have to have this done every year, year after year after year, because he died once. And so if you could lose your salvation, according to the writer of Hebrews, well, then how would you get it back? Because if the debt is paid and you incur a new debt, according to Colossians, that debt has been paid and nailed to the cross. Well, then who is going to pay the new debt that you incur? It's, it's as though that God says that the price that Christ paid, the blood that he paid, was not sufficient. Now, eventually we'll get into those passages that there's just no way to overcome. And I would love to see. But if we go back and just listen to what God has stated he is going to do. He has stated for us in the past, before the incarnation of Christ shows up, we're going to see God stating that he's going to put his spirit in our heart. In Ezekiel 36, we've covered this past before, but in Ezekiel 36, he says that, he, he, that I, I, God, will wash your heart and I will, in doing so, cause you to walk in my statutes. Can't get around that. And then Jeremiah 32 tells us that when he does so, two things are going to occur. One the believer will not depart or turn away from God, nor will God. And John 10, which we'll get to specifically and explicitly all throughout these other scriptures as well, that, that, that we send a leapfrog over 
to find a passage that tells us that we can lose our salvation. We miss the passages that confirm that we will not. But what he has done is he has given us ways. The Again, I said it before, the Bible will tell you how to determine who a Christian is and who's not. So running to a passage where he's saying, if you are doing these things, you're not a Christian, does not prove that a Christian can lose their salvation. It's a warning passage to show us that you were never one to begin with. All right. Thank you, Corey, for that rebuttal. All right, Dr. Brown, you are back in the seat for your five-minute rebuttal. And once again, I'll start your time as soon as you begin to speak. All right, thank you. Yeah, number one, I did not read a single verse out of context. Number two, not a single syllable that Corey spoke of in any way refuted a single verse that I had read in context and in terms of its meaning, which I'll explain clearly. Number three, I'm, I'm a little surprised by references to all the verses he's going to bring up. Those are supposed to be done at the outset so that I can then rebut them in the time of rebuttal or raise them in cross-examination. So I hope no new material is going to be raised for the rest of the debate because we're supposed to be debating what we presented in our opening statements and there were minutes forfeited. So I'm just trying to have an ethical, honest debate here. Uh, but no, of, of course, nothing I read was out of context. Uh, for, for example, uh, Colossians 1, he says to them, you, and I'll read this again, you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation, if you continue in your faith. It's clear. Hebrews 10 is also explicit. It, and, and Corey told us that Hebrews is written to believers. So the warnings about uh, you, you, you're partaking Christ, if you hold your original conviction firmly to the end, that's written to believers. But Hebrews 10 explicitly says that the one who continues in willful sin after having been sanctified by the blood of the Son of God, right? Quote, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant, that sanctified him. He has been sanctified by the blood. If he goes on in willful, deliberate sin and despises the cross that once saved him, all he has to look forward to is fiery judgment. And the same thing in 2 Peter, the second chapter. Those who have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that's the language through Peter. That's what it is to be saved, to know the Lord, right? What does is, what is Jesus pray in John 17, 3 to the Father? What is eternal life? That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus, the Messiah, whom you sent. And these, these are Peter's very words. Therefore, dear friends, since you've been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away from the air of lawlessness and fall from your secure position. They're already in a secure position, but rather do that what? Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is how he speaks of saved people. I, I mean, it's kind of shocking to claim that every single verse I read is out of context. We'll dig as deep in the context as you want with each and every verse. Nothing's been read out of context. I was quite careful uh, to do that from the start. Galatians, this is people who have received the spirit that Paul is writing to in the third chapter to say, well, this is to try to say who's a true believer or not. No. What, is, what does he say? Let's, let's look at the words again. You have what? Been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. You were there in grace and you have rejected it. You say, well, then who pays for your sins if, if you reject it and come back? The same blood that always paid for your sins, the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. It paid for our sins when we were in the world, but as long as we were living in unbelief and sin and rejecting the cross, as long as we did that, that blood did not avail for us. He did not waste what he did. He died on the cross and paid for the sins of the whole world. Every human being, 1 John 2, 2, he's not the propitiation for our sins only, but those of the whole world. Hebrews 2, he tested, tasted death for every man. Jesus gave his life for the whole world. Whoever believes not perish, but have eternal life. That's the blood he shed for the entire world. Yet all those who reject him die in vain. The blood is not in vain. The blood now provides salvation for all who will call on him and secures the salvation of every believer who will follow him. That's, that's plainly taught in the word of God. Yet if we reject that, we die in our sin. So if we knew the Lord and turn away, we die in our sin. He, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 is also best understood as someone who is in a continual state of rejecting him crucifies him afresh. The whole Bible 
speaks to those who apostatize, those who turn away, those who fall away and says, come back, come back, come back, come back, come back. So to repeat, not a single syllable I said was out of context versus explicitly addressing believers who have received the Holy Spirit, who have received the grace of God. It's all quite explicit, yet we can walk away from him. We can turn our backs and these warnings are there not to separate the true believer from the false believer, but to encourage and help the true believer not to play games with this great salvation, but rather by his grace and with his keeping power to persevere in holiness until the end. The word is really quite explicit, to be honest. All right. Thank you guys both for the openings and the rebuttals. So now we're going to transition to our cross-examination and in this cross-examination, once again, it's 20 minutes each to ask question, a total of 40 minutes. And in this cross-examination, if you can answer your opponent's question with a simple yes or no, please do that. You do not want to bog your opponent's time down with long-winded responses. And try to be direct to the question as quick as you can with the question so we can continue to transition through the cross-ex. Uh, that said, Corey, you're up first for your 20-minute cross-ex of Dr. Brown. And... I've been I've told people in the past before that I do I don't do formal debates because I'm not formal. And so you have to I have to ask your apologies, uh, Dr. Brown, if I bring in scriptures that I did not uh, submit earlier that I didn't say think about earlier. But I trust the fact that you have uh, been so learned that none of these would bother you. Uh, and so I want to ask you this question uh, in regards and one of the passages that I always run to. I, I, I alluded to it earlier. John, chapter 10 and the whole of John chapter 10, but there's a specific verse in John chapter 10, Jesus is going through his description of what a sheep is, what a Christian is. He says that the sheep follows him. So describing what a Christian is, sheep hear, sheep follow, sheep do not listen to another voice, sheep run away from the stranger. But then we get to 27, 28, he makes a statement that I have not found anyone, especially some someone who happens to be a Greek grammarian, only them to, to, to back up what I'm stating. That is in John 10, 28, he says that uh, he gives three clauses. He says that I give them eternal life, neither shall they ever perish, nor shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. Clause B, he makes a statement. And I want to see if you agree with this and if you apply this uh, the way that I would as well. The statement that's made in the Greek is, and I'm sure you're, you're probably familiar with this, with this double negation, uh, this emphatic negation of the subjunctive, junk, of the, of the subjunctive the ume apolontai, which means to never, ever, ever perish. And of course, as you would know, that in using this, this means that not only will they perish or the possibility is negated of them perishing, but this, this double negation also implies the possibility of a future event causing the parish is also negated. Do you interpret John 10, 28, the Greek of John 10, 28, to mean that a person can not or I mean that the person can in fact perish. If so, why would you do so? Uh, be because uh, John 10, 27 identifies the sheep as those who in an ongoing way uh, listen to his voice and follow him. So you can be a sheep and then you can cease to be a sheep. Those who are his sheep, and this is a constant theme, you know, same in John 6, 37 to 44. But speaking of those who continue in the faith, those who persevere in the faith, as we saw in Colossians 1, that, that you who, who have been reconciled and forgiven through the blood of Jesus, you uh, will be presented holy and blameless if you continue in the faith. So those who live as sheep, those who continue to follow him, absolutely, we will never perish. He will absolutely well, keep us. We can walk away. The, the word is constantly telling us we can walk away. So those who are his sheep, meaning walking in ongoing obedience and fellowship with him, yeah, you're safe, you're good. You got nothing to worry about, nothing to think twice so about. You'll never so Jesus, perish. Jesus describes a sheep as walking with him continually. Jesus describes a sheep as continually hearing. Jesus even describes the Gentile sheep that he's going to go and get as they will follow and hear. So these are what, we, what Jesus says that a sheep will do. He's given a description of a sheep. He also says that when they hear another voice, they will not listen. He says they will turn away and run. But then the Greek of this, and you find a scholar such as Dr. Stevens, Dr. Mounds, Dr. Fanning, or Dr. Wallace, and, find, and they will tell you that implicit in this double negation, this emphatic negation of subjunctive, means that the sheep cannot stop following. The sheep cannot walk away. The sheep cannot stop being sheep because of this 
ume apolontai. How does a person get around this grammatical construction of the Greek and say that now all of a sudden the Greek rules don't matter? Well, that's that's the interpretation of some scholars. Surely, you know, other scholars, I would hope you've researched enough that, you know, other scholars who don't read it like that. I haven't don't found understand one the Greek, text to say that. But I haven't I'll found check one out Greek. Professor Robert Gagnon. Start there. OK, check did, out Professor did, did, Robert did, did, did Gagnon interpret- and what he has to say about once saved, always saved. He's a highly, highly respected Greek I, and New Testament and I, scholar. I, I've heard other scholars say so, but I've never heard. And, I, and I'm still waiting for one Greek scholar or one Greek grammarian to refute what I'm saying in John 10. And that's not me saying it, but what yeah, John- Yeah, Corey, Corey, I'm, I'm, I'm answering you. There are other Greek scholars who differ. But, but they're I'm not, not a here. Greek scholar, so I'm a Hebrew you. scholar, but there are other Greek, you're not a Greek scholar either. So you're relying on these others. And there are others who differ. No, 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 no. In other words, you're trying I'm to read something. Opinion, I'm, I'm giving, I'm, with all respect, sir, okay. I quoted verse after verse after verse after verse, which anyone reading English can understand, let alone reading in the Greek, which only reinforce it. You're trying to nuance a point, which number one would negate all the other scriptures, so I, I'm not going to do that. And number two is say that some Greek scholars hold to this, but not not all Greek scholars do. Surely you're now you may not accept their arguments, but since you're not a Greek scholar either, you have to do that with humility and say, okay, there are Greek scholars who read it this way, and there are others who don't. But Dr. Brown, we don't have them here. I have you here. I'm asking you if because if we have this, if the Greek is clear, and you disagree, but it's not clear. It's not clear. I disagree that it's clear, as do other Greek scholars. Yeah. So tell me, as you read the John ten twenty eight in the Greek, as you read that passage, how do you get past the ume apolontai eis tan aonian? How do you get past that? How do you take that not to mean what I just said? It very simply. Uh, Let's try it again. Those who are continuing to walk as sheep will never perish, just as it's translated. In English, that's it's very right. simple. That is not how it's Those who right. choose to walk away. All right. So, so Corey, here, here's the deal. First, you didn't present this at the outset, which is the whole reason for opening statements and rebuttals. OK, forgive me. Second, I'm answering you now in the cross examination and saying, mm-hmm. with all respect, mm-hmm. this is what it means. This is what I understand it to mean. This is what other Greek scholars understand it to mean. Now, you may say you reject my view of the Greek and the, you reject the view of other scholars, that's fine. I'm answering you in terms of how I understand the Greek. We both agree that it's talking about those who are ongoingly walking with the Lord, right? From what I understand. Well, that it, No, that, but, but where- And where that you were saying that a true sheep will never walk away. I'm saying there, Brown, there are warnings throughout scripture about sheep where walking Where does it say away. in John 10, that if you continually are walking, you're adding, you're adding words that the passage no, doesn't say. John 10, 27, could, could my sheep, hear my voice. I know them, they follow me. And What does I it say in verse 27 in the Greek? In verse 27, in, verse 27, in, the, 27 Greek. in the Greek, ta probata, ta ema, which is the sheep of mine, takes phone, is the voice of ma, of uma, of mu, uh, akusun, akusun, which is they okay, are Okay, so hearing. what is akusun? Can, can you parse that for me? They are hearing, this is the, this is the plural, present active indicative, which means they are hearing. Exactly. So, That's my so point. He's, they are currently so, walking with him, currently following him. Well, what, no, no, Those are but the, the way you described it are. as, but wait a second, you described it as a condition. Jesus is not describing this as a condition to be saved. He is saying that this is what the sheep will do. He's not saying in order to be right. a sheep. Correct. This is what a saved person will do, but you can turn away from being saved. It's very simple. I've been saying but, the same thing over and again. So those who are following him, those who are following him, and again, you don't do debates a lot, so benefit of the doubt. Cross examination is not argue back and forth. It's ask a question, get the answer, go on to the next okay. question. So I, okay. I'll, I'll I, do it differently I, I if you that. want. I mean, if you want to just go back and forth for the whole forty minutes, and we turn the turn the tables halfway through. But I'm I'm just trying to do it the way I understand it, it's it's supposed to be done. So Again, I, I maybe, maybe someone else is, is missing what I'm saying, so I'll say it again. The sheep of Jesus are those who, not those who once heard his voice and walk away, but those who continue to hear his voice, continue to follow him, and these promises are given to them. He will keep us safely to the end. It is possible for someone to walk away and cease to be one of his sheep, in that case, the promises don't apply to them. It's that simple. 
okay, so this is why I'm saying this. According to, and this is why I, I, I harp on this, because what people tend to do is to move around that. What you have done was you have made a condition to be a sheep. Jesus is not saying if you continue, then you're a sheep. No, he says you are a sheep and this is what you'll do. And what causes that, oh, by the way, I would say would be, and I, I alluded to this earlier, um, which is Jer Jeremiah 32, 39, where he says he puts his spirit in us. And then in doing so, he won't turn away from us, nor will we. Well, if we won't turn away and he won't turn away, well, then no one's turn away. Ezekiel says, I'll put my spirit in you and cause you to uh, walk. So with, with all respect, this is not cross-examination. This was what should have been done at the beginning. You're supposed to be asking me I, questions again, to respond again, to I, I, yeah, Corey, I apologize. I, hey, Corey, I let's, apologize. Let's, try to, yeah, let's, let's, try, let's try not to go on monologues. Let's try to get some questions to, to Dr. Brown. Well, the, the question that, that I'm trying to the, the question I'm trying to ask is how do you make the statement in either 27 or 28 that this is conditional to being a sheep? I didn't say it's conditional. It's descriptive. This is how the sheep behave. This is how you know who a true sheep is. It's not conditional. Okay. It's descriptive. Simple. So, so since we know that this is what a sheep does and this is what a sheep is, then why would we turn around and say that if anyone that acts not like what he's describing, they too are a sheep. They're not. But you said, you said when Jesus speaks about or when Paul speaks about or when the writer of Hebrews speaks about how a person is acting or behaving, if they're living in sin or they're doing these things, then that person will lose salvation. But what they're describing is someone, what they're describing is someone who's not a sheep. So why would you, why would you assume the passages that you read, why would you assume that those people are sheep? Why couldn't those just be Corey, warning pastors? I'm not assuming it. The writers say that they are believers, that they have been sanctified by the blood of the Son of God, that they have known the Lord Jesus, that, that their sins were forgiven, that they were reconciled to him. The, the writers are explicit. So he is writing to sheep. But that's the whole point. Uh, you, he does not make us stay sheep. He does not make us stay in the sheepfold. And we can walk away to our own destruction. Hence the exhortation at the end of James 5. If someone, a brother, walks away, we're talking about someone who is saved. And there are verses explicit. Galatians is explicitly written to believers who had the Holy Spirit. Ephesians explicitly written to believers who had the Holy Spirit and who were in Christ. So these are sheep that are being warned. Okay, so you, in re, James 5, you said that this is a brother, but he says, if any among you. So isn't James speaking about, because again, where are the passages then? Because you would agree that there are people who also would claim to be a Christian who aren't. Where are the passages warning them? Would not, is not James 5, 19 and 20, a passage warning because he's because he uses the word who men, which is among you. If anyone among you, if we, anyone ain't who men, anyone among you, not you, but amongst you, like you go to church. How is he not warning those amongst the believers to go back and save this person who is and he calls him a sinner? Why? How is he not warning them to do the same, to go back and bring them back? Yeah, the, the language of James is so simple. Look in verse 13. Is any among you in trouble? You're, you're reading among you, trying to read something into the words, the exact opposite of what he's saying. Um, the, those among you are the believers. Is any among, among you, you in trouble? Among you. Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is any among you sick? So he, every time he's saying among you, just a few verses either. Brothers, this is those among you, those among you, those among you. So this is the whole point. My brothers, if, if one of those among you should wander from the truth, this, he's making it explicitly clear, not just calling why him a brother. Then but, why but he's, he's say it's the exact same Greek. Is, is any sick among you, right? Mm -hmm. Is anyone among you in trouble? Does one, does, does one among you leave? Here's how you get them back. Of course, he's ready to believers. You, you, how you would, turn how, how would, the, the meaning of the Greek completely upside down to make it the opposite of what it means. You're saying I'm turning upside down. So let me ask you this question. How would you write it in the Greek to refer to someone who's not a believer? How would you write in the Greek? How would you write to the believers how to deal with the non-believers among you? How would you write it? You'd say some among, I'm, I'm not going to say it in Greek because I, I don't uh, speak uh, biblical Greek, etc. I do it in Hebrew if you want, but that's not going to help us. But you just say there are some among you who claim to be believers and are not. 
you'll know them by their fruit. I mean, Jesus does it in Matthew 7. Beware of false prophets, right? They're, they're sheep in wolves' clothing. You'll, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. You'll know them by their fruit. So, so it's very simple. So, There's some among you who claim to be believers, but you'll know them by their fruit. Okay. So, easy. It seem to me, so it would seem to me. So because you could just simply take out the um, and taste and who man, if you take out the and, you just simply put if there's any of you. Same with John, with James as well. James uh, uh, five thirteen. If any among well, you, why so does he say might... is any among you in trouble? He means non-believers in their midst. Let them pray. Why well, are they praying? If there is anyone happy, let them sing songs of praise. Is he writing this to a non-believer? No. I mean the, the language is it's the way he's talking. Hey, is there any among you? you? You have a theology that you're coming to with the book, and now you have to twist the words no, to make not them twisting. mean something that they don't mean. Well, see, you just admitted and notice, though, you they don't... wander from the truth and you bring that person back. You mm -hmm. can't bring someone back who was never saved. You can't bring someone back to the faith who was never saved. You can't bring a person back to the to this to the to the tenets of the faith. Well, that, well who cares about coming to the tenets of the faith if they're not saving faith? So if you a don't person, bring a person so back to something they never had. So let me understand this correctly. If a person if a person understands what the gospel is. They understand that, yeah, Christians believe that Jesus died on the cross and so forth. Maybe they grew up in church. I don't know, but they're not believers. They're not actual saved. And they leave that, go to Islam, go to what have you. They can't come back to that. That couldn't be what that means because that's absolutely what it means. No, but will it do them any good unless they really know the Lord for themselves? No. And yet he says, if they come back, right, they will, you'll, the, you'll save them from the error of their way, save them from death, and cover over a multitude of sins. So this is talking about coming back to a saving knowledge. You had this, now you come away, and it's explicitly, it's people among you, which in his language is talking about fellow believers here. That, that's my yeah, point. I mean, though, Dr. His, Brown. his own language is explicit. But Dr. Brown, that's my point. You would not use the among you in order to say what you just said. You would just simply say, if any of you that's that's the whole no, point that's he, the whole no point. james doesn't talk like that to them i i i just i show you two other verses only seven verses before this and it's the same thing and it's the is same any among thing. you in trouble so he's not talking to believers there he's talking to believers about those among them but the, because who the is he talking uh, who are there among them uh, believers among them or non-believers among because, them because dr brown here's the point is he talking about now you would probably take this as a physical healing I take this as more spiritual. The reason why, because if it's physical, then this doesn't work 100 percent because we know of people that have we prayed for and didn't get and didn't get healed. So the prayer well, we of the pray righteous in faith, even right, praying we pray in, faith. in faith, the prayer offered we, in faith will make the sick person. It's explicit. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on healing. If you want to I, fight me on healing, that's a whole other debate. Yes, but I, I would I, not recommend. I, but with all respect, point. buddy, I right. wouldn't recommend you go there. And and, and well, I would I'm going just to say well, that. All right, guys. Hey, Corey, let's go ahead and get some questions to Dr. B Dr. Brown. Let's get some uh, some direct questions to him. Okay, I'm sorry. Here's a direct question. If Jesus, not Jesus, but if God says that when he places his spirit in you in Ezekiel 36, that he will cause you to walk in his statues, is that a true statement? Does, does it mean that, what does that mean to you? Yeah, that's what happens in the new birth. We don't have the fullness of the new covenant yet. That will come with the Messiah's return when we will never sin again in our resurrected state. And that's ultimately what Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34 and Ezekiel 36 are looking forward to. But absolutely, the new birth, we're changed 100%. We now and live so differently. We, so we will walk in his statutes? Yes. Okay, okay. Because it makes me wonder then how, how we then um, sin and fall away for walking in. But you said something earlier in one of the passages, you, you, you quoted Revelation 3, 5. You said that he who overcomes, and reading the passage again, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments and I will not erase his name from the book of life. You took that as it's possible to have his name erased. The reason why I bring that up is because the same grammatical construct is there, uh, the double negation of the subjunctive, which states uh, when he says that he will he will thus be clothed in white and I will not uh, erase his name as who may so that very so the double negation of uh, the subjunctive is there also. Why do you see this as him saying that he can erase their names when he says I will never, ever, ever erase your names? Why would he say that if they can't be erased? If, if I say to you, I, I, if, Brown, if, if I'm holding, to, if, if, if I'm not allowed if, to ask questions, Dr. Brown. 
well, I, okay. I'm answering the question with a question. Uh, it's, it's, I'm gotcha. not, uh, this, is, this, is, this is not a question to him. This is, this gotcha, is the gotcha. answer to the question. Okay, please. All right, yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so when, when, if I say to you, I will never let you go, you know, you're, uh, you're, hold the, you're, you're, you're hanging by the side of the boat in the water and I got your hand, I said, I will, not, I will never let you go. Well, it's possible I could, but I'm promising I never will. So if it's impossible, if it's impossible for someone's name to be writ, uh, blotted out of the book of life, if once our name's written in the book of life, it will never, ever, ever, ever be uh, blotted out, no matter what, no matter what we do, no matter how we turn away, et cetera, then why is he telling us that? How is that a promise? To It's already done. Why even tell us that? Why not because just say said, your name is secure? Why say I will not blot it out unless there's a possibility that he would? That's because in the Greek, that's how you would say it. He says the Hanukkah, which is he's not saying if you overcome, he's saying that you are the overcoming ones. And he says, because of this, he says, you will never, ever, ever under any certain, this is this what the, the grammatical construct of this emphatic negation of subjunctive means, you will never, ever, ever be blotted out, just like in John 10, 28. And so why would you say that he could be blotted out? The passage doesn't say so. Yeah, well, again, right. it's supposed to be cross-examination, not monologue, but we're, we're out of time, so we'll, we'll switch here. All right, Dr. Brian, you're up for your 20-minute cross-examination. Okay, if, if you can answer this with a yes or no, are, are you 100% sure that you're one of Jesus' sheep? Yes. Okay, so it's impossible for you to lose your salvation? Impossible. I have the Holy Spirit in me. Impossible. Oh, okay, so what do you do? Let's, let's go to Colossians 1, okay? okay and let me, let me just read it again, and then just, just tell me how that speaks to you, where he's speaking to a believer and says this, that you'll be presented without blemish, etc. if you Which continue passage? in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. So for you as a sheep of Jesus, how does that verse apply to you? Can you give me that passage again? So I, I'm, I'm pulling it up. I'm sorry. Colossians 1, mm -hmm. 21 to 23. I just didn't want to read all of it on, on your time here. Okay. So he's clearly writing to believers. You've been reconciled by Christ's physical body through death. You were once alienated. You're not anymore. Right? And, and you'll be presented without blemish, free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Mm -hmm. So how does that relate to you? The Lord speaking that verse to you as one of his sheep, where he says, this will happen if you continue in your faith. Why put the if there? If there's no possibility well, of you not continuing. Okay, good question. As I said before, the Bible also writes to people to warn them to make sure. And so he didn't just put the if there. He also put the, he put a gay. The gay is the indeed. And so he says, if indeed. And so Paul is saying, make sure. I think it's vitally important for everyone to make sure. Paul makes this statement. Jesus does. He says that uh, everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. And he says, for those who didn't actually know him, he didn't say, I used to know you. He said, I never knew you. The same thing here says, if indeed. So I believe that in order to be saved, you have to continue. You have to keep believing. You have to remain. You have to abide. I believe that you will. But if a person who is not, this is these are passages for them to make sure if indeed you are. If indeed you are, you're fine. If you're not, that's you. That's the person the warning is going to, to check oh, Okay. Let, let, let me just... Look at this again. You were alienated. You were enemies, but now he has reconciled you. All right. And he will present you holy without blemish. Isn't he clearly talking to believers there? Aren't you reading something in that's not in the text to say he's speaking to unbelievers among them? When he says you were reconciled and you will be presented holy, you were enemies, but you're not. You're reconciled. Isn't that explicit language that he's speaking to a believer there? So when you make the statement to a, to a large number, because the, the, the writer of well, Paul's not writing to one person, he's writing to a church. And so implicit in that there's going to be some that are believers, some that are not, some that think they are and so forth. And so if you were so he's saying those that are forming, but this is why he says that a gay to make sure that is if indeed that is make sure that's you. That is if indeed this is you who were forming. That's why you put this in there, the a gay in the Greek to say if indeed you are. The same way that if you were up preaching and you were preaching to the church, 
you're going to tell the truth of the gospel, but then you're going to also say, make sure if indeed that is you. And so that's what the writer is saying here. Well, Paul is able to do that elsewhere, 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. But he's not talking, saying examine yourself. He's saying if you continue in your faith, how can you continue in your faith unless you're in the faith? Because again, that's always been the, that's always been, again, if indeed you are continuing, if indeed you continue, present active indicative. And so that is, if indeed you are continuing, well, remember, he's already, the Bible's already described what sheep do. The Bible's already described that sheep continue, that they believe, they follow and so forth. That's what they're doing. If that is you, then you're fine. So this applies to you, but if not, how else? How so it else doesn't mean continue. Want? It means make a start. If you're not really saved, how can you continue? If he's writing to someone who's maybe not saved on the Colossians, which I completely reject, by the way, the language is 100% speaking to the elect there. But putting that aside, it, it, he says, if you continue, how can you continue if you're not saved? If you're not a sheep, well, how can you continue as a sheep? Here's the truth of the gospel. Wouldn't Jesus he, wouldn't he have to say, if, if you repent and turn and be saved, how can I tell someone who is not saved to continue in a faith they don't have? A believer, or any, well, let me say this, any person can believe, a believer or a non-believer. And when I say believer, I mean a, a Christian, a non-Christian can believe. How do I know? Because Jesus makes this statement in, in Luke 8, speaking about the parable of the sowers and the, and the seed. And they're those that believe for a moment, but then they stop. So anyone can have a mental ascent. They can believe. It's the, it's the ability to continue. Where does it say mental ascent here? I'm, if you I'm, continue I'm, I'm, in your faith, he's saying if you stay in that I'm same faith that you have now, you'll be established and firm. You're I'm saying they don't have any faith so at it, all. So, so it's possible. I'm just asking for, the, the, the explicit language, whether you can read Greek, whether this was in 10,000 languages, it's all saying the same thing. No, How well, can you, you can continue so. in? If, if indeed you are continuing, there are people that can start and stop. Jesus gives that example in Luke 8. And so what keeps a person continuing will be the Holy Spirit because we've we've established, at least we should have, according to Jeremiah, according to Deuteronomy, according to Ezekiel, where he's prophesied that these are going to happen. So when the Spirit is in you, it's going to cause you to keep continuing. That's why he used Got the it. present active participle <clears throat> in describing believers as believing, as right. overcoming, as following, as hearing. That's why he keep using these tenses to describe believers. We don't find passages often where the believer is described as someone who believed for a moment it's almost always describing a person who is believing. John 3, 16, John 6, yeah, there, all throughout. Yeah, there, there are plenty of passages that speak of past tense uh, believing. But uh, so Can you answer no question. Uh, sure, just uh, go through First Peter, go through First and Second hey, Thessalonians, Corey, reference to their faith that they had. But again, this is for, for me to, to be questioning you here. Okay, so um, you can answer this with a yes or no. Someone who momentarily gives a mental assent, but is not truly saved, has that person been reconciled to Christ? No. Okay, all clear. All right. Um, someone who has been sanctified by the blood of Jesus, does that speak of a saved person only? Yes. Okay. So could you please go to Hebrews 10 then, where it mm -hmm. says, Beginning verse 26, anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much is more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the spirit of grace? The warning is coming to someone who has been sanctified by the blood of Jesus but continues in willful sin. How is that not speaking of a believer? Because again, the, the whole to, to go to 10, 26, 27, 28, 29, and to disregard what you read previously uh, does a disservice to what the writer is speaking about. Those that, it, again, the blood is offered to sanctify you. By the way, it's, it's heiress passive indignity. So if a person has been sanctified, that person doesn't have to worry. But if you think so, again, he says, how much more so? Going back to- wait, 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 Hang on, just, just to be clear, you're saying what we all know, that the Greek is saying that he has been sanctified. Mm -hmm. But it says this person now, let's just read it again. How much more severely 
Do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him? And what does he look forward to? Fiery judgment that will consume the enemies of God. This is someone who has been sanctified by the blood, but now continues in willful sin. They will face fiery judgment. Isn't that clear? Okay, so let me read it to you. He says, and ho, um, agaste, which is in which sanctified. It's not referring to an individual person. It's referring to the blood which sanctified. So it's not referring to the individual person. It's speaking kind of holistically. So anyone that will trample underfoot the blood of Christ, which sanctified, not necessarily that person. That's how this is read. That's how this is understood. Because again, yeah, he's speaking to a group of believers of these Jewish believers. And their understanding is that, wait a second, I need to have my sins atoned for. He just told them, you don't have to do this all the time once was good enough and that we can have this confidence and so the person he might he might he might be talking to people who believe that you can sin uh come back to christ sin again with impunity come back to christ because what you're doing is you are you are nullifying the the fullness or the uh, uh the the fullness of his blood so what you're really doing is in many cases you are trampling underfoot the blood of christ those people who know what he's done and then still continue in sin. That person is not saved. This is all he's speaking of. And so if that's you, well, then you, you, have, you have a problem to pay. If that's not you, so, that's okay. the whole point. The whole point of all right, so, so a specific translation question. I'm sorry. Uh, a specific translation question in terms okay. of the meaning of he, the, by, by which he was sanctified. That's what you're missing. It's inherent there in the verb. He was sanctified. Just for everyone watching, if I can show you, say, 30 or 50 or 100 translations of the New Testament that all say the person was sanctified by the blood, the person was made holy, right? Not just a generic by which sanctification happens, by which you were sanctified. I'm not going to take the time to read them. But should we listen to Corey Minor or to all the other translators? Are you saying all English translations are wrong here? No, I'm not saying that at all. Because every one of them reads it the same way. I mean, you just call out a translation, I'll read it to you. But, you know, NASB has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. Uh, NET, uh, again, I'm, just, I'm not going to take your time, but every single translation says it's the blood by which the person was sanctified. NET profanes the blood of the covenant, okay. profanes the blood of the covenant so that made say, him holy. So, let me so are you saying so, that you, all these translations are wrong? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that at all. I'm, I'm not saying the translations are wrong. I'm saying it could be the, I believe in, in your case, it's your understanding. But the blood that's offered for a believer is the blood that sanctifies. Is that sanctifying blood, does it, does it, does it actually work for the unbeliever? It's presented for the unbeliever, obviously. It's to sanctify him but clearly he is not sanctified at that moment. He's not been set apart. Now, he could also be referencing the fact that for these Jews who understood that this blood was set for them, this blood this was made for them, though it was made for them to sanctify him and he didn't place faith in it under the old covenant uh, atonement. Is he, though the blood was set there to sanctify him, is he sanctified? Is he atoned for? That's the point of the writer here. And in this case, if you have faith, unlike under the old, if you have faith, then you don't have to worry about it having to be done year after year after year. Why do we ignore? Right, right. Okay. So, so you're saying that when Jesus. the Greek says the blood that sanctified him, that it doesn't mean him. I'm saying the, 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 the Greek translation, aho, is the, the word he is not there. Now you can imply it or you can say it. Well, it's not he, implied. It, it's, it's, it's third. It's, it's, it's. It's third singular, aorist, passive, indicative, right? I'm just look, you know, look, so I'm not giving it out of my head. I'm saying right, right in front of us is as parsed in, in the grammars. Okay. But, 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 so okay. So, so you, are, you are refusing to see that it's speaking to someone who has been sanctified by the blood, even though the Greek says that he was sanctified by that blood, that it's not speaking to someone who was sanctified by the blood. Even, even, listen, even taking your, even taking it that way, that he was sanctified. The point is this blood that was given for him, follow me, 
this blood that was given for him, this propitiation that was made for him to sanctify him, that was set apart, fine. He was sanctified. Is he, is he atoned for? The point of it is, yes, he is. However, if you are the kind that, as he says earlier, go back to verse 26 as you read it, he says, for if we go on willfully sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, which is what I said earlier about having this knowledge, there no longer remains a sacrifice of sins. His point is that a person who continues to do so, uh, that person clearly is not saved, obviously, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire, which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses died. I'm sorry, I don't mean to keep reading all this, but how much more severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the, the, uh, the son of God? And has regarded as an unclean, as unclean. I'm sorry, but, the but blood. Corey, you okay. said at the outset that someone who is sanctified by the blood of Jesus is saved. Now you're saying they're not saved necessarily. Because I asked you, that's how I started it. I, I asked I'm, you first. You can go I'll, back and I'll review it. it again. Anyone who is sanctified is sanctified. As a matter of fact, those who are sanctified if, are being okay. perfected. If, if so, if someone was, if anyone was ever sanctified by the blood of Christ, they are always sanctified. That's I believe, I'm, I'm saying that again. Yes, a person who is sanctified is sanctified. The writer. Okay, so the was writer, this person? The Greek says he was sanctified by the blood of Christ. Is that true or not? It's true. He was sanctified. Oh, okay. We'll just leave it there. Uh, uh, enough said. Uh, let's go over to to Galatians five. In the third chapter, he talks to them about they had received the Spirit by faith and that Jesus was presented to them a certain way. And, and you know, they're clearly believers that he's, he's writing to. But then in the fifth chapter, he says that because they have now sought to be justified by the law, they have fallen away from grace mm -hmm. and have been alienated from Christ. So he's speaking to people who had the spirit, who were believers, who have now been alienated from Christ. And in the fourth chapter, the 19th verse, he's praying that Christ will be formed in them Again, isn't this clearly speaking about believers here, alienated from Christ, fallen from grace? They had the spirit, but now they have fallen away. Well, again, chapter five, he's saying that anyone that is desiring to be saved by the law, you have been cut off. You have been severed. So you cannot be saved. Your only route has been cut off. Notice he's saying you who are desiring who are seeking to be justified by the law. So those people that are seeking to do so, they cannot be saved. Now, if there's anyone that, so I'll just leave it at that. He's clearly making a differentiation between anyone who wants to be saved by keeping the law. That person cannot be saved. You're cut off. Oh, okay. Isn't Galatians Paul writing to believers here? I'm astonished you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is no gospel at all. Evidently, mm -hmm. some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. So he says, you're quickly deserting the one who called you. He's writing to the churches in Galatia, but now saying, I, I don't know what to make of you because you, you've turned away from the faith you had. You received the spirit previously, tells him in the third chapter, but now you've mm -hmm. alienated yourselves from Christ, fallen from grace. Isn't it clear he's addressing those who were believers but are not any longer? Wouldn't it be safe to assume that everyone in Galatians doesn't fit under, under the same umbrella? Meaning this, that there are some, because the Judaizers are coming in and telling them, now they're new, telling them that they need to do this and do that. And so he's saying that if you are if you are seeking to be saved, those who, who are saved or those who want to be saved, because in, in, in chapter 5, 4, he says those who are seeking to be saved, if you if anyone, this goes for anybody, if you are seeking to be saved by the law, you are cut off from Christ. So I'm, I'm, I'm failing this to say the fallen from grace, deserting the one who called you, alienated Impressive. from Christ. So Impressive. you're fallen from where you were. You can't fall from somewhere where you weren't. You've fallen How from grace. Can't? How come? If I, if I say that, and I use this example all the time, if a football team or basketball team is playing and they've lost 30 games in the first 40 games, that team has fallen from playoff contention. They've fallen from the playoffs. Hadn't gone there yet. They, or you take the wrong route. And no, they're the falling from playoff contention. 
Fallen from playoff well, you, contention. They were in playoff from, contention. You've fallen from right? the playoffs. You met you fallen from the no, playoffs. No, no, they didn't fall from the playoffs. They fell from playoff contention. They can't fall if from the playoffs unless the, they're in the playoffs. Okay, my my analogy, if you fall from the playoffs, which happens all the time, some team doesn't do well at the very beginning of the season and they are already out of the playoffs. Have they gone? No. Or you've been cut off. You went this road, the bridge is out, and so you are cut off. Doesn't imply that you've been where you're going. It just simply means that you've been cut off. We take the mindset, especially if you hold to that fact that you can lose your salvation. Oh, it seems that you've cut off. This is just simply directional. You have fallen away from where you ought to be going. Not that you've been there. Okay. I mean, of, of course, I differ with your analogies there. All right. Last question, because we don't, we okay. don't have uh, time. Of, and, uh, of course, every passage I read, I could get into the same point for point with you uh, to show nothing's out of context here. Uh, does the New Testament address people as brothers and sisters in, in an epistle, in a letter who are not saved? I think the new, I think when addressing brethren, um, I think he does. So those who are saved and those are kind of in a, in a generic sense. So, yes. Oh, OK, so all, just, all the passages like Hebrews three that addresses brothers, see to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the mm -hmm. living God. That's addressing a brother saying, correct, according to you, it's addressing someone in the Lord, but saying, make sure you don't have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Isn't that speaking to, you just said a brother's a believer, well, but to well, why tell okay. a believer, make sure you don't have a sinful heart? How would you, how would you address the person who, who may not be a brother? How would you address them? How would you warn them? The point is that these Those who letters, claim to be brothers and sisters, those among well, you who claim to be saved, Etc. Dr. Brown, I'm out of time. If you, if, if you want to address a person who might not be saved or they may be saved, he says, make sure again, I agree. You have to make sure, make sure that you don't have this unbelieving heart. Make sure you don't have this evil heart and you make sure that this is not you. If this is but you, you don't have to be you're sure. You're, you're, huh? but you're already sure. You don't have to be sure. You don't have to ever check yourself because you know that you're saved. So you never have to check well, yourself. Once right? a per, one, once okay. A per, okay. Once a person is saved and the person has the Holy Spirit, obviously they know. But to the person who might not be sure, there are those who just simply are. You not. could never there be deceived. You could never be deceived. Then. All right. All right, guys, that concludes the cross-examination portion of this debate. Now we're going to transition to our closing rounds. Uh, once again, our five-minute closings, and then we'll jump into the Q&A. So everyone out there, get those questions in, because we'll have a 30-minute Q&A after the closing remarks. All right, uh, Dr. Brown, you will be going first in the closing. And so I'll start your five minutes as soon as you begin to speak. All right, the, the evidence of Scripture is quite clear. There's not a single verse, not a single syllable I took out of context. I didn't need to argue about a nuance of the Greek that Greek scholars will debate. Uh, that's why every English translation for every verse would verify every word that I said. So assuming that most out there are not Greek scholars, and, and I'm not a Greek scholar, neither is Corey, but for everyone else, just go ahead and read every verse that I read in the context of the whole book. All right, you'll see nothing was taken out of context. Corey tells us he does not have to check himself. He does not have to examine himself because he knows that he knows that he's saved. Therefore, it's impossible that he falls away. I say that's the great danger of one saved, always saved, because you can easily fall into deception. Hence, all the warning after warning after warning to Spirit-filled believers whom Paul has said, you are in Christ. You have the inheritance of Christ. You have the deposit of the Holy Spirit. I want to say again, I started with verses. John 10 is the very first thing I referenced. No one can pluck us out of his hand. Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing outside of you that can pull you away from Jesus. You are absolutely secure. But the warnings say, do not walk away. Addressing brothers and sisters do not depart. We have Hebrews 10, which the more we got into it, the more it confirmed what I was saying, and the Greek is explicit. Someone who has been sanctified by the Son of God, which Corey himself said is a believer, is being warned about if you go on deliberately sinning. And you think, well, I'm already forgiven. I'm already saved. I already The blood's been shed. No, no, no. If you despise that by continually sinning, and rebelling against God and saying no to the Lordship of Jesus, you will face 
fiery judgment in the future. In the same way, those who escape the corruption of the world by knowing the Lord Jesus, that, that's, that's, that's how Peter describes being saved. Just read through 1 Peter and 2 Peter. That's how he describes being saved, knowing the Lord Jesus. You can start there and turn away. It would have been better for you never to have gone that way before. And again, where we started, if we disown him as believers, we, believers, if we disown him, he will disown us. And the words at the end of James 5, those among you, those among you, that's how he talks. That's his language speaking to the believers there. Again, the more you dig of the Greek, the clearer it becomes. Explicit, clear. If one of you should wander and someone brings that person back, they'll be saved from the error of their way, saved from death, and a multitude of sins will be covered over. There is a reason that there are so many warnings in the New Testament to believers, explicitly to believers. Ones that Corey says you don't have to worry about, you don't have to think about. If you know that you know that you're saved, if you have the evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life, you will never turn away. I could talk from experience and tell you about people that walked in the Lord for years that I knew and that were followers of Jesus and that were as born again as I was according to everything that I knew. And then after many, many years, turned away from the Lord. But that is something only God knows. God knows the heart of every individual, in which case it's very possible Corey is self-deceived. It's very possible he's one of those self-deceived believers. Or you could say it's possible I am. Once you're now going to question, uh, uh, when, when Paul writes to believers and James and, and Peter writing to believers and talking to believers and telling believers to examine themselves, they, they, they once were alienated from God. Now they're in him. Now they're in Christ. And he gives them warnings, explicit warnings. All right. You say, well, if you're truly saved, they don't apply to you. Now the whole thing just becomes one big game because maybe you're self-deceived. You don't really know it. And that's part of your self-deception. We do well to revel in the grace of God and his keeping power and, and to just rest secure in that as I do. I never, ever for a split second worry about, quote, losing my salvation. But you better believe when I read these words, if my heart was not right, if my heart was straying, if I was playing games, these words would hit me hard and clear. Warning, warning, warning. And it is because I take these warnings seriously that my security is deepened in the love of God and in the fear of God. Ask yourself who went through scripture, who presented a plain argument. I think it's pretty clear what the word says on the subject. Thank you. All right, all right. All right, Corey, you're back in the seat for your five minute closing and I'll start your time as soon as you begin to speak. Dr. Brown and other debates and so forth will always bring up his knowledge and understanding of Hebrew. And because he's not as knowledgeable in Greek, then I should not bring up Greek. That is patently unfair. I'm going to use Greek because the words were given to us in Greek. And so should I ignore that? The fact of the matter is, if these words don't mean anything in Greek, they don't mean anything in English. Now, Going back to the scripture, the Bible is clear what God is trying to do. He said that he is going to put his spirit in us. He's always said he's going to do so from Deuteronomy to Ezekiel to Jeremiah. And in doing so, we wouldn't turn from him. Jeremiah 32, 39 and 40, Ezekiel eleven nineteen, 19, Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, that when he does so, it's going to cause us to walk in his teachings, his commandments, his statute, meaning we're not going to sin. Then we see that those who are born again are overcomers and the overcoming ones, he says, he will never, ever, ever blot their names out. There are all these different passages that warn people. Obviously, you've got to warn somebody who might not know, who might be unsure, who might think they are and might not be. But Jesus makes his statement. If his words mean what they mean, then let's go with me. He says, truly, truly, John 5, 24, I say to you that whoever hears my words and is believing, present active participle, who him who sent me, he has present tense, has eternal life, and does not come into judgment, but past tense has passed from death. The words matter. Ephesians 1, 13, Paul tells us that we've been given this deposit of the Holy Spirit, this our bond, which is this earnest money deposit. How long do we have this deposit has been given to us? The Holy Spirit, the very same spirit that's going to keep us and cause us to walk. We have it forever. 
John 6, 47, he says, truly, truly, I say to you that he who believes, again, present active participle, this is what he, how he describes the believer as someone who is in a state of continual belief, he has present tense at that moment, life into the ages. This is why Paul can say, I'm confident that he, that is God, who began this work in you, 1, 6 of Philippians, that he is going to perfect it until the day of Christ. There is no passages, matter of fact, no examples, as I said earlier, of a person who we know for a fact is a believer. And then know for a fact that is no longer a believer. We don't find that anywhere in scripture. And so the reason why I brought up the Greek in the first place, one, because it matters. The rules of Greek matters. Like when he, if he's going over Hebrew, the rules of Hebrew matter. The rules of English matter. That's the reason that's the purpose for these. And so the reason why I wanted to deal with John 10, 28, because if John 10, 28 is what I say it is, and not just me, but I, I appeal to other Greek scholars, but I can do it on my own. I understand the Greek to that much degree to where I know that this is stating the rules of Greek state that an emphatic negation of a subjunctive means it eliminates even the possibility of any act in the future. So nothing can cause this person to lose their salvation in the future, according to Jesus. If that is the case, and then if this other passage, whichever passage you go to, says that you can lose your passage, well, then we have a contradiction. But we don't have that. Again, what sense does it make for Jesus to have gotten on the cross? Because remember, remember, guys, we have the same pattern in the new as we have in the Old Testament. We have a high priest. We have a sacrifice. We have a scapegoat by which the sins are confessed on that scapegoat. Under the old, your sins were, you were atoned for and in right standing for one year. So under the old, you can be atoned for and then later on not be atoned for. Well, if that's the exact same stance that we have today, where today you can be saved or be atoned for and then later not be atoned for, well, then what was the purpose of Jesus coming if everything is exactly the way it was, which is the point of Hebrews. And we can tell you Hebrews 10, if you are going to trample underfoot the blood of Christ, well, then it is no effect to you. If that's what you think of the blood of Christ, you might not be saved. Maybe you're putting too much emphasis in your own ability to keep yourself. Remember, he is the one who gave us to the, to the father. Not a, I'm sorry, God is the one who gave us to the son. It's not that we give ourselves to him or anything like that. The gift is that God gives us to Christ. And he states in John 6 that all the ones that the father has given to him, it's emphatic and definite in the English and the Greek. He will not lose not one at all and raise every last one of them up, whether you read in the English or the Greek. All right. All right. Thank you both for a fantastic debate. Appreciate both of you guys. I know both of you guys are passionate about what you believe. So I expected some energy there and I, we definitely got that and I appreciate both of you guys. All right, so now we're gonna transition to the 30 minute Q&A here. Uh, with the Q&A, both of you get one minute each to interact with the question. And so mm -hmm. let's get going on this, uh, this Q&A here. We have, Let me see, we have some super chats, They're like post description. I wanna see if you go, what you guys think about this. All right, so we have a super chat here from Child. Thank you so much for the support. And he posted 1 Corinthians chapter one, verse 21 through 22. It says, now it is God who makes both of us, both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set, it, set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. What do you say about that, Dr. Michael Brown? Yeah, um, just one quick comment, Corey, for your future reference. Uh, it's uh, considered highly unethical to bring in new arguments in the closing statement that persons cannot respond to. So all the verses you quoted at the end, you should have quoted at the beginning so I could have responded to them. Uh, and so just, uh, I, again, I'm kind of shocked by that. But uh, to interact with this verse briefly, yeah, uh, the seal, uh, if you look in, for example, the BDAG, uh, uh, BADG, DG dictionary, you know, standard New Testament lexicon, it'll explain that a seal in passages like this, for example, in Ephesians 1 that was just referenced, that, that's just a, a mark that um, it doesn't mean you're sealed, that you can't break the seal, but just you're sealed. You're, you belong to the Lord and the deposit's been given. Absolutely. 
I referenced that several times. And that's why the very believers to whom these words come are also warned later about departing from the faith. So, yeah, we have the seal of the Spirit marking us as belonging to the Lord. We have the deposit of the Spirit uh, assuring us that we belong to him and guaranteeing what's to come. If we reject that, we reject that to our loss, hence the many warnings that we looked at in Scripture. But I, I live in the grace of this every day and, and love it. All right. Corey? Well, let me just say this also. I apologize for the uh, for the not being up on the formal rules. Truth be told, you, you really do win a lot of people on something this important, informal rules, informal debates. I, I apologize for that. But again, because you are so learned, then you should be able to handle this. And so I apologize again. I can't but handle that, it if I'm out of time to respond. But, that's the whole thing. That, that's where you can't raise it in the final closing arguments. That's, that's the ethical part. Again, again, yeah, I apologize. Totally forgiven. Again. Totally you forgiven. Know. Okay, no problem. Okay, so we don't have to, so we don't have to bring good. it up again. It's all good, all clear. It was done innocently. So, it was done so it's clear that he says that he's a, he's establishes he established us in Christ. By the way, this word seal is the same word that we see in Ephesians one as well. And so this seal is almost is tantamount to what you saw in the seal, obviously greater than what you saw in the Roman seal uh, around the tomb. So when this seal that's been given us, this is God placing His seal on us. Guess what? We are not going to be touched. Notice what he says, a seal uh, to us. Uh, I'm sorry, he sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. That matters. And so just even the plain reading, it mean, it doesn't mean he gave us uh, this seal and a pledge, same word that he uses in, in Ephesians, just for it to go away. Remember, this seal and this pledge of the Holy Spirit is until to take us to eternity with Christ, to take us to he heaven. We can't get past that. That's exactly what Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 means. Same thing here. All right. And we have another super chat here. More, more of a scriptural verse. I want you guys to see what you guys think. Uh, blessed are those. Uh, thank you for the super chat, by the way. Smart, simple, fit. Appreciate it. Blessed are they whose lawless acts are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Romans chapter Amen. four, verse seven through eight. What are your thoughts on that, Corey? Well, I, I think it, I think it is uh, pretty self-explanatory. Our sins will not be imputed to us. Blessed is the man whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. My deeds have been uh, forgiven, and so and they have been covered. And since they've been forgiven, been covered, I'm in right standing. What new debt will I have to incur? What there is no more debt because my sins have been forgiven. And so, and, and as Hebrews says, which we, you know, we, we go from one passage, skip over these other passages, but in Hebrews, he tells us that because there is no longer a debt, there is no longer, uh, uh, my sins have, have been covered, my sins have been remitted, then there is no more need of a sacrifice. And so I agree with this passage. All right. Yeah, I agree with it wholeheartedly. I live guilt-free because of it, fully forgiven by the blood of Jesus. But if you want to take this in a way that goes beyond what Scripture says, well, what about 1 John 1? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins as believers, it's present continuous in the Greek. And by the way, I didn't say you can't bring Greek. I just said there are scholars who differ with some of Corey's interpretations. That's it. And, and I'm not the, the, the Greek scholar that's going to settle that argument. But in any case, what it says here is, is straightforward that we are in a state of forgiveness in terms of the sins that we had committed that had damned us to hell. What happens if we sin as a believer, which we still do, right? And we confess that to God. Well, why am I confessing it to God? If, if you want to press this verse that the sin will never be counted against you, why am I confessing anything to God? Because in our ongoing fellowship, sin is still comes up and has to be dealt with in our relationship with God. And if we reject this love, this cross, this grace, then we're back in our sins. That's why all these verses give us all these warnings to the New Testament. All right. And here's a super chat. This question is for Dr. Brown. Thank you, Alton, for the support. Appreciate it. If a person is a new creation in Christ, how can they be made old again? Yeah, by getting out of Christ. That's pretty simple. If you're in Christ, the promises are to those who are in Christ. If you get out of Christ, you're gone. You're, you're, you're back in the world. You're lost. Just go back, start the debate again from my opening statements, and go through every single verse I referenced if you didn't write them down. These are all warnings to people in Christ, to believers, explicitly Hebrews 10, sanctified by the blood, Colossians 1, 
uh, reconciled through the cross. These are all believers. The Galatians who had received the Holy Spirit, the Ephesians who had received the Holy Spirit, these were new creations in the Messiah. Uh, you can, just like you cannot walk out the image of your new creation as a believer by falling short, you can reject him entirely. And interestingly, the Jewish uh, excommunication formula was lo ticha, I've never known you. So when you were excommunicating, excommunicating someone who had been among you, who was one of you, a genuine Jewish covenantal follower of the Torah, and then that person turned away, the excommunication was, I never knew you. And that's what Jesus is doing in Matthew 7, which is a separate point. But very simple. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation, you can reject Christ, you go back to the old creation. Tragically, it happens. All right, Corey? This, this, seem, this seems to be in line, and I agree with, 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 with Alden, the reason why I brought up, and this seems to be in line with what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, that those who are, are born again, born, they're made new as, because again, this doesn't come up out of just thin air. Remember, God has stated that he is going to do so, obviously not the, the entire man, his flesh and so forth, but what he's speaking of is inwardly. And so as the Lord puts his spirit in us, he is going to cause us to be a certain way. We will be born, and that they know they're born from above. And because we're born of the spirit, we're going to walk in such a way. And so uh, I don't understand how a person can become old if he has made you new. I, I think it's a great point that Alton makes. All right. And here is a super chat. Uh, can uh, thank you, Morgan, for the support. Appreciate the support. Can both Corey and Dr. Brown please restate their exegesis of John chapter 10, verse 28? You guys got one minute each, so I don't know how, <laughs> how fast you're going to exegete that verse, but uh, have at it, Corey. Okay, let, let me let me just read this. Uh, and I, I've, I've stated this before. I'm going to read this pretty quickly. This is the rule governing John 10, 28 and other passages. Emphatic negation is indicated by Ume plus air subjunctive. What it's stating, what it literally stated, it's the strongest way to negative something in the Greek. In other words, the, the strongest way to something is impossible. The state it's an impossibility is to have u me and a subjunctive. He stated that there, there are some Greek scholars that disagree, but he won't find one Greek scholar that disagrees with my exegesis of this passage. That's the point. Not whether they disagree on one saved, always saved, but do they disagree with the with the explanation or the exegesis of this passage in the Greek? Can't find one just yet. Now you might think it, it, it doesn't apply, but the best of the scholars will say it does. One might think that the negative with the subjunctive could not be a strong possible way, but he says that it's the most emphatic way to do so. And look what he says. He says that Ume is the most decisive way. This is Dr. Do, Dr. Do, uh, Dan Wallace, the most decisive way of negativing something in the future. That's implicit in this rule uh, that, that we see in John 10, 10 28, this emphatic double negation of a subjunctive a subjunctive guys is the probability or possibility you may but if you say it is impossible for this possibly to happen that's how you would say it in greek jesus understands this john the writer says this he says it is literally impossible and so if you could lose your salvation if you could perish that would negative that would contradict the first clause a and clause c of john 10 28 as well as the other parts of John 10, where he says that all my sheep keep hearing and following will never follow anyone else or turn away. He says, he goes on to say at the end that God, the father is the one that gave them to me. And so therefore you will never perish. Dr. Brown. Yeah. Robert Gagnon, top class Greek New Testament scholar would differ, Corey, as I said, with your interpretation of John 10, 28, that it, it uh, speaks of once saved, always saved. Uh, Robert Shank, in his book, Life in the Sun, Study of the Doctrine of Perseverance, would categorically differ with the conclusions you are drawing from John 10. But my exegesis is very simple. Those who are Jesus' sheep are characterized as those who are actively following his voice, and they'll never perish. Simple. Very simple. You can walk away and cease to be one of his sheep. Hence the constant warnings in the New Testament to believers. Hence the, the whole of the Old Testament about Israel being God's flock and then people 
walking away and turning away those who were his sheep, leaving the sheep pen. The same way we are sons and daughters of God. As sons and daughters of God, nothing can touch us. But God will not force us to stay in the house. That's why these warnings are so relevant. To Would say that they're only relevant that? to people who, who might think that they're saved and, and are, are not is, is to twist all these verses and turn them on their head. Would you, I'm right. sorry to interrupt. But would you be able hey, to forward that hey, that you stated hey. that Robert Gagnon um, stated? Would you be able to forward that? Yeah, sure. And, and you've, yeah. And Robert Shank, I'm sure you've read Life in the Sun, but you know he differs with you categorically and gets into the Greek in great detail. All right. And here is another question here. Thank you, Jesse, for the super chat. Appreciate the support. This question for Dr. Brown. Does Romans chapter 6, 8 through 11 teach you can lose your salvation? What is your understanding of this passage? So Romans 6, by the way, it's, it's interesting that every single question as far as it's been with from a once saved, always saved person, or apparently by verses raised, which is wonderful. I'm so glad I get to talk to you. Right. If we die with Christ, we believe we'll live with him. Since Christ was death, can, he can no longer die again. Death, he died, right? Same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. So this is talking to believers and telling us as believers that, that we must die to sin and live to God, that we're not under law, but un, under grace, meaning that we've now been empowered by grace to do the will of God. But we also know that, again, the passages in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, about God putting his spirit in our hearts and new covenant, we haven't come into the fullness of that yet in this world. The fullness of it will never ever sin ever, not even for a split second. But in this world, there's still a battle, hence the possibility of apostasy. But Romans 6, uh, 8 through 14 uh, says nothing either way about once saved, always saved, whether you can forfeit your salvation or whether you can't. It's simply speaking to believers to say no to the flesh, consider, to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. All right, Corey. Again, he has the word if there. And I've always agreed with this with this one point with those who believe that we can lose our salvation. I believe that uh, there needs to be a warning for those who are what we would call a false convert, those who may think they are. And I think everyone, uh, I would, you would, and Dr. Brown would, and, and many of the people in the chats would agree that there are people who think they are and are not. Again, most people in America call themselves Christians. We know better. And so there's a warning. So if you have died with Christ, then there's the assurance there. That is, if indeed, which is why we have these warning passages. All right. And here is a super chat for Corey. Thank you so much for your support, D. Appreciate it. Why does author Hebrews include himself in the in warnings? Verse 14, we become partakers of Christ if we hold firm. He knew he had the spirit, yet affirms here he could fall away. Ten, where, where, where are we speaking of? Uh, he said Hebrews, not sure what chapter. He just said verse 14. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't include a chapter. Chapter three. Okay, three. Okay, yeah, chapter, go there. yeah, go to chapter three. Okay, thank you. Uh, four, I'm sorry. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast to begin. Okay, I, I don't I don't see a problem with that. Again, if we have become partakers, and I don't I don't see a problem with him becoming all inclusive. It really is the same way that if any of us were to get up and preach, and I'm preaching to an audience. I've done this many times. I'm pretty sure Dr. Brown has done so, where he's including himself in the admonition and uh, to to the audience that if we he believes that he has, but knows full well there might be some that have not. And so I think the writer is saying the same thing here. If we have become partakers in Christ, which is a perfectly reasonable way of putting it, if we have become partakers in Christ, and if we hold fast uh, the, the uh, hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end, I agree with that. If we do, I believe that we will. I believe the Bible describes us, Jesus describes believers of doing so. How do you know you're not a Christian? How do you know you're not a believer? Well, test for yourself. I can't tell. I can't tell if you're holding fast. You can. I can't tell if you uh, what, what what's happening behind closed doors. I can't tell what's happening in your heart. You can. And so to be all inclusive, the writer here is saying that if we, whoever whoever the writer is, if we are hold, are partakers of Christ, if we which means also if we are holding fast the beginning of our insurance, then guess what? We will be saved. So I don't have a problem with even someone saying if. 
that doesn't nullify one saved, always saved, because again, you need to make sure that you are that person. So a perfectly good word to use is if. Yeah, so of course the emphasis was on we, and it looks like a question from someone that would share my perspective. Yeah, of course, your question's exactly right. He's talking to believers. See to it, brothers, we have come to share in Christ. So he's talking to, to brothers in the Lord and warning about the possibility of falling away. And, and here's where, with all respect and really out of love uh, for, for Corey, uh, it becomes a tremendous concern when you say the warnings don't apply to me because I know that I know that I'm saved. Be because James 1 says, don't deceive yourselves. We can deceive ourselves as easily as we can deceive someone else. I've met people living in blatant sin and assuring me they're right with God and they know that they know and they're already forgiven and using all the verses and arguments that Corey's used and, and they're in self-deception. The moment you say that these verses do not apply to us as believers and they cannot apply to us as believers is the moment you open the door to the possibility of self-deception and the possibility of getting pulled away because you throw out the very warnings that God has given us to help us persevere. So again, take the warnings seriously. How long? Until your dying day, resting securely in the Lord. Like I said, I never worry for a split second about this in terms of am I saved, am I forgiven? I also take the warnings very seriously. So I walk in the love of God, and if I turn away from the love of God, well, then there's the fear of God. So please, my brothers and sisters, I'm talking to you as believers, just as Paul, just as Hebrews, just as Peter did, speaking to you as believers. That's why I call you brothers and sisters. Please take the warnings seriously. Let me say this also. Yeah. Listen, when uh, you asked uh, me earlier. Hey, core, 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 core. Sorry, there, there's, sorry. there's no response uh, responses to Dr. Brown, Dr. Rossan doing this portion okay. of the debate, man. Sorry, man. Uh, also, I want to add, uh, I know a lot of questions for been for Dr. Brown. I take the super chats in order as they come. No, it's so, fine. It's no problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just wanted. To, just it's want no to make problem. Sure I'm not. You know, I don't want to make. Oh no, make, no, no. I, I, yeah. No, you you do whatever you want to do. We're good. I'm good. Okay. I was just all noticing. Right. I, I was commenting on the very thing. Who was posting? That's all. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. No problem. No problem. All right. So here is a question for Dr. Dr. Brown. All right. We're good. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you for the super chat, Run Master. Appreciate you for the support. Uh, in Second Samuel chapter twelve, verse twenty-three, when David lost his child and said he will go to him, could David have walked away after saying that? Yeah, human beings say all kinds of things. First, I don't know that David uh, had had uh, an explicit confidence, you know, full knowledge that in terms of all the details of eternal life after you. But let's just say he did. Let's say he had a, a greater revelation than someone else in the Old Testament, as opposed to meaning, hey, he died. We're going to die one day also. Yeah, you can say all kinds of things. You can tell your loved one when they're dying, hey, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to see you again in heaven. And then walk away from the Lord, blaspheme the Lord. Yeah, so just because someone says something. I mean, I think we all agree you can say something, and it's not true. You mean it today, and, and you don't live it out tomorrow. So sadly it happens all the time all right uh corey uh I, again I don't, i'm not sure what um if we could take uh david's word as let me just put it this way gospel um not totally sure uh what but now i do know this though uh do i now you know let me rephrase this david knew who he was chosen by god david knows what god was doing in him and so forth um now David also makes a statement that he will go. I don't know if he fully uh, uh, knew or if he was uh, making a statement or if he did know. There's there's just no way to know fully uh, what David was thinking or even what he may have uh, been privy to from the Lord. So I don't know. Uh, I don't think that he would have because the promise is still for him and through him and this prophecy uh, regarding him and his lineage through this line of Judah. So uh, I don't think that it would have happened. Uh, could it have happened? I'm going to also probably lean that no, it could not have happened either. All right. And here is. Here. Right. Here's a, another super chat here. Thank you. Renewed Minds Ministries. Appreciate the support. Um, anybody who believes you can lose your salvation, believes you are saved by your own works of salvation. He said he will cause you to walk in his ways. 
uh, that's probably directed towards you, Dr. Brown? Yeah, number one, I trust fully in the grace of Jesus, 100%. I put zero trust in me, 100% trust in the grace of Jesus, and it's a complete a misrepresentation of, of my understanding of salvation to say I rely on my works. 100% trust in the grace of the Lord, put zero trust in me. At the same time, I know the word calls me and calls all of us to participate. So 2 Corinthians 7, 1, having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that, that defiles flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Or in light of the fact that it's God who works in us, what, what does it say? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So we respond to God's grace with our works of obedience. Uh, so, so Acts, uh, Acts 26, 20, Paul's gospel, he preached that people should repent and prove their, redeed, their repentance by their deeds. So the, the new life is the evidence of the new birth, all right? Uh, and the fundamental way, though, that someone forfeits their salvation is by refusing the grace, is by refusing the gift, is by no longer believing and turning away. So we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. We can reject that grace, in which case we're lost. It's, it's quite explicit in terms of the warnings. All right, Corey? I believe it's clear. As a matter of fact, it gives an opportunity to kind of uh, respond. Thank you, Pastor Trey. Um, I don't. Be I believe that I'm saved. I believe that I'm saved. And because I'm saved, the Bible says, in regards to my salvation, then to work. And so I can prove my salvation. I can prove my heart. I can prove my love of him by me walking in him. If I don't walk this way, well, then I'll know. It's not to take an arrogant stand that, that I can never fall. I don't mean to be taken that way because you asked me a question. Do I believe I'm saved? Sure, I believe I'm saved. Just like you absolutely believe that you're saved. The difference is, though, I believe that I will be kept saved and I'll prove it by my work. And so God says that he will cause us to walk in his teachings. I think that is clear. I think that is um, without controversy. And so because of that, he will cause me to walk in his ways, which means I will not sin my way out of salvation. All right. And here is a, another question here. This is for Corey. Thank you for the super chat, Logan. Appreciate the support. Can people's names be taken out of the book of life? And if so, does this go against your view? There is no passage that says that they, they will be taken out. We can't find, there's not one passage that says a name will be blotted out of the book of life. Now, there might be someone that might want to say that uh, Moses or David was asking for that, but this seems to be indicating the book of the living. But even still, there is no such example of anyone's name being blotted out. And Jesus makes the promise that no one who is an overcomer and he calls it. He didn't say if you become an overcomer. He says that you overcomers will be clothed and I will never, ever, ever under any circumstance. And I'm adding that because that's the, again, the emphatic negation of a subjunctive that I will never, ever, ever blot your name out. That's a promise. It's not a threat. John, I mean, Revelation 3, 5 is not a threat. It's a promise. And so therefore, uh, we don't have to take it as that. Dr. Brown? Yeah, so again, that, that completely confirms the point. The reason it's a promise is because he'll never do it for us. It's If there is no possibility of it happening, you don't need that promise. The promise is that it won't happen to us. What's interesting is, is using the argument from silence during the debate to say, look, you have Hymenaeus, you have Alexander, you have these others who are, who are mentioned, right? But we don't know if they were saved or not. Well, we don't know that they weren't. Right. So, so to, to raise that as an argument, it's, it's best to say we, we don't know. The New Testament might well speak of someone who is a true believer and departed, or maybe they were never true believers. But to make it an argument decisively one way or the other is not wise. The danger, again, comes in, OK, you can't sin your way out of salvation. So how much can you sin and still be sure you're saved? Uh, what if you fornicate once a week? What if you commit adultery once a month? What if you download porn once a day? What if, what, what if you deny the Lord twice a week? You know, where, at what point does someone then say that they're not sure if they're saved anymore? And then it comes back to those who say once saved, always saved, either open the door completely to, to um, all kinds of licentiousness because, hey, can't lose your salvation. Or you have to check yourself all the time to see if you're really saved to make sure you're holding into that standard. 
So it, it's kind of a, a quandary either way. All right. And here is another super chat. Thank you, Slam, uh, for the super chat. Appreciate it. This is for Dr. Brown. Initially, I agree one can turn their back on God. If so, what does the scripture say about the ability to come back to the Lord? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so James 5 explicitly talks about that situation and urges us to bring that person who is a believer, was a believer, bring them back to the Lord. They can receive mercy. The, the threefold parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son in Luke 15 speak emphatically to that, that the Father is waiting for us to return, longing for us to return, but he will not force us to stay. He will welcome us back with open arms and free from condemnation. And the whole history of the Old Testament, I didn't want to get into a lot of Old Testament passages because we could debate uh, things have changed through the cross, etc. So I, I wanted to stay on the New Testament side of passages, almost without exception. That being said, the whole history of Israel is that constant theme, shuva banim shuvavim, erpam techem. For example, Jeremiah, the third chapter, turn back, O back-turning children. I will heal. I will forgive your backslidings. So the constant calls to the backslider to come home, come home, come home, that door remains wide open through the New Testament. It is the same grace. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, which can create problems for people on all sides of the debate, I believe is translated in the ISV and some commentators would understand, is while you are in a state of rejecting the Son of God, as a Jewish person, you think, well, I can go back to the temple sacrifice. No, no, no. There's no sacrifice that remains for sin. And therefore, you cannot be reconciled to God in that state. However, if you humble yourself, turn back. Forgiveness is always there. Always there. Corey? Well, the interesting thing is that the uh, the only time that we see the term backslider is, is in regards to Israel. And God keeps telling them to turn back. God keeps telling them to get your heart right. God keeps telling them to not sin. And they never and they never get right. So what is God's promise? God's promise is to do something to their heart heart he does something to their heart as he says that will cause them one to never turn away and that he will never turn away why do we take take it that he did not mean that they will not turn away from him and then he would not turn away and again if you can turn away then it's a contradiction i know he reads it differently but it's clear that if you turn away then according to hebrew 6 we've got a contradiction now could you turn away prior to the holy spirit could you believe prior to the Holy Spirit and then stop believing prior to the Holy Spirit? Sure, the scriptures are clear on that. But could you believe having the Holy Spirit and turn away? No. And if you did, the writer of Hebrews says it's impossible to bring that person back. All right, all right. And we have a super chat here. Corey, this question's for you. How does he understand John chapter 15 verses one through two? This was one of the passages where, matter of fact, just John 15 as a whole, was one of the passages that caused me initially, I was on the other side. I believe that you could lose your salvation. I fought and fought and fought with everybody. My pastor, who was also a uh, professor, he was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. And so I'm just going back and forth. I just would not relent because of John 15. I believe without question that if you do not abide, you will go to hell. If you do not bear fruit, you will go to hell. I believe that without question, but also, Depending upon who you think this is for, if this is speaking to the disciples, uh, well, then he makes a statement that I have appointed you that you will bear fruit. If you think this is for it's all inclusive, fine. You still have to bear fruit, but I still have appointed you that you would bear fruit and that, that you should remain and that, and that fruit shall remain. And so I think he's clear that uh, these people, whoever he's speaking to, they will bear fruit. They will abide. We've told that we're going to abide. As a matter of fact, he uses that same word in the present active tense, I'm the present active participle, describing us as remaining and abiding throughout scripture. And so uh, that's how I take it. I think it's important. Remember, I said that there are these passages that will warn us. And so if you are a Christian, you believe you are a Christian and you are not abiding. Now, I can't tell you how your fruit looks. I, I'm not a fruit inspector. Uh, your fruit might look different to, uh, uh, to me or anyone else you know. And so if you are not abiding, you know, if you're not a bearing fruit, you know, well, then you are not saved. If you are, you know, then this, uh, then there's no need to worry. You are safe. That's why we have these passages for those folks who just aren't sure or who can see for themselves 
how they live. I don't know how Dr. Brown lives at home. I don't know how Marlon lives. I don't, I know how I live. And so I can examine myself and see, I am fully confident and persuaded that I am saved. And so because of that, I live in such a way, this is the confidence that I have that I can walk in this way. Dr. Brown? Um, yeah, again, uh, I was a Calvinist from 1977 to 1982, quite dogmatically. Uh, and uh, with all respect to my Calvinist friends, uh, ultimately abandoned it because I felt it contradicted the overall testimony of scripture. But yeah, this is a warning to believers, to those who are in him, to those who are in Christ and calling us to persevere. So you can be in him, but not necessarily persevere to the end, meaning you could fall away. The whole point we've been making all night, verse six, if you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, the promises. So we agree here that, that those who are spoken to as believers are those who are in the Lord in fellowship with him. But what's fascinating is we heard quoted over and over again tonight, I'll put my spirit in you, I'll put my spirit in you, I'll cause you to walk in my commandments. But Corey would, I believe, would say that he still sins, that he still falls short, that he's still not perfect. So we haven't arrived in the fullness of that promise yet. Again, that happens with our resurrection. We have the first fruits of it now. So I rest in the grace of the Lord. I, I rest in the forgiveness of the Lord because of what Jesus has done. And where I fall short, I run to him immediately for grace, for cleansing, and have full assurance of that ongoing fellowship uh, because of his goodness. And if I reject it, if I choose to walk away, which is a very real possibility, hence the constant warnings in the New Testament, then we'd pay the price. Interestingly, Hebrews 6, Corey is saying that if you uh, came to the, the faith but never truly believed and then turned away, you could never come back. That would be even scarier, not even in in the first place, turn away and could never come back. Where's the mercy, grace of God in that? Very strange. All right, we'll take a couple more questions here, and then we'll shut this thing down here. Um, we got Super Chat from D. Steven. Thank you so much for the support, D. Corey, Luke chapter 17, 31 to 36, Jesus warns of running back and consequently not being taken with him. This warning can't be to false professors because they can't lose salvation by running back. They're ne they never had it. Luke chapter what again? Chapter 17, verse 31 through 36. And so, okay. Well, um, <laughs> this is not about salvation, number one, uh, that that particular passage. But, uh, and I'm trying to read because it's, it's hard for me to read the wording on, uh, on okay, let me just read it right here. Uh, this warning can't be the false prof uh, professor's professors because they can't lose salvation by turning back uh, they never had it well this passage isn't that's not what this passage is about but let me address the issue about someone turning back again if a person lives a lifestyle of sin uh dr brown made the statement what if you sin all the time well then that person isn't saved again you examine yourself you know full well if you live a lifestyle of sin, this isn't this isn't even difficult. People, unsaved people even know how they live. Christians obviously know. And so if we've got what is describing a Christian, a Christian walks this way. Does he walk this way perfectly? No. A Christian should not live in sin. Does that mean that he does not sin ever? No. That would make him a liar. But if a person lives a lifestyle of this way, and really, truth be told, we know that a person does so, has no real remorse. And so if that person has done that, if a person lives in sin, if a person is having extramarital fails every other day, if a person is lying and stealing and fighting and wanting to commit murder, that person's heart, that's why the writer says, make sure that you don't have that kind of heart in you. If you do have that heart in you, then guess what he's just described? An unbeliever, an un a believer doesn't have that heart. And so uh, one, that passage that I don't think that's what this passage is talking about, but two, this is how we've constantly been told how a Christian looks, and we've been told how a non-Christian looks. Let's not confuse when he tells us what a non-Christian looks like to mean that that is a Christian who has fallen. All right. Yeah, so um, once again, we see how Corey's answer really opens the door wide 
to self-deception. And tragically, I've met people raised in once saved, always saved, that will be in all kinds of sin, but saying they still know they're saved. Um, how much sin? How much porn? Uh, what about thoughts, the thought life? Uh, what about the sin of prayerlessness? How many people are guilty of that all the time? Are, are they not, not saved? Maybe you have to pray enough hours in order to be saved? You see how you can really open up the door both to works righteousness and to deep self-deception. Instead of saying you're saved by grace and kept by grace and walk in that grace, and if you reject that grace and turn away from it, you can be lost. But as long as you're receiving it, walking in it, wonderful. It's interesting is a, a passage that ties in with Luke 17, uh, Hebrews 3.14 that I referenced earlier. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end then I could well argue with Corey that actually you can't know that you're saved until the very, very, very end. Until you're with the Lord, then you know that you know when you see him face to face because you have to hold the conviction to the end. So maybe you persevere for a while, five years, 10 years, 20 years, but it wasn't true. It looked true, but it wasn't true because you didn't make it all the way to the end, in which case, unless you make it all the way to the end, you're, you're not eternally saved. You say, well, how does that speak to me? It speaks to me knowing that we could reject the Lord's grace, right? So that's the whole thing. That's, that's the whole point of the warning, and that's why we take them seriously. Please, my friends, take the warnings seriously. They're there for you and for me because God loves us as believers, as his kids. All right, and that's going to be the final question of the night here. Another super chat. Thank you so much, Acts 413 Bible College. Appreciate the support. Why didn't Christians teach once saved, only saved, always saved before John Calvin? Dr. Well, Brown? Oh, or, I'm sorry. Yeah, just not address oh, anybody, I, I, just flat question. Uh, once saved, always saved is, is not what Corey's teaching the way some would teach it, meaning that no matter what you do, and, and that's what I would really, really take the strongest issue with, no matter what you do, no matter how you live, you're still saved. Corey is not saying that, and I applaud him for that. We are step for step with that. Calvin didn't teach that either. Calvin taught the doctrine of perseverance, that those who are truly saved will persevere in holiness until the end. That so, so he taught perseverance of the saints, and it seems that's more what Corey is teaching, perseverance of the saints, as opposed to once saved, always saved. So uh, Calvin didn't, so I, I, with all respect to the questioner, I, I would differ uh, with, with the question. I don't believe that the doctrine of once saved, always saved, not in the way Corey's teaching it, but in the way of no matter what you do, no matter how you live, once you pray a prayer of faith, you're in, you could never have a single holy day, you could live for the devil every day of your life, but you're still saved. That's absolutely a more recent doctrine that was not taught through church history. The question was whether it was perseverance of the saints that the truly saved will persevere in holiness or whether you could reject your salvation. That's where the greater debate would have been. So with all respect to the question, I don't think it's an accurate question. And again, Corey, to be very clear, we, uh, because we've had the, the heat of the debate between us, we absolutely agree that true followers of Jesus will be known by their fruit. And those who claim to be his, who are walking in willful, unrepentant, deliberate sin and refuse to turn back, Either they were never saved, that would be your view, or my view, they were never saved, or they've turned away from their salvation. But I want to end on a note of harmony that we do believe the truly saved live like saved people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would say this. Um, I, would, I would be careful of anyone looking for what the early church fathers or what the early church might have believed. You got to remember, guys, that the majority of church history and the majority of church writing that we know of was dominated by the Catholic Church. There are other writers or other other people who have made statements outside the Catholic Church. Uh, and, and then it also ends up being how a person determines or interprets some of these writings. So let's say, let me just rattle off a couple of names. Clemens of, of Romanus, uh, Irenaeus, Tertullian made some statements. I don't think that he was, but made some statements. Um, so too did, obviously, Augustine. Uh, Ignatius made some statements. Someone is going to interpret these early church fathers' writings in one way or the other. But the truth of the matter is... It doesn't take but a second for a person to move away from the Lord and then to have doctrine to go different directions. And so it doesn't matter what early church fathers believe or what early writers believe. By the way, Calvin wasn't the first one to hold this particular position. Uh, that doesn't matter. 
we still have to hold ourselves and govern ourselves to the scriptures. And so kind of like what Dr. Brown is saying, I believe this, that a true believer will at, at some point in time, at least to himself, look like a believer. Uh, it should be that a true believer should see, should be seen as a believer to non-believers. It should be that because you are light in a dark world, Jesus said, let your light so shine that people see your good works and then do what? Glorify him. And so it should be evident by your walk that you are an actual believer. It should be evident to you by your heart, the fact that whenever you sin, you're bothered. It should be evident to you by the fact that you love the Lord, that you want more of him, that you desire more of him. Whichever side of the ledger that you're on, if you desire Christ, it should be evident. All right. All right. Cool, guys. Thank you so much for participating in this debate. You guys are great. Once again, passionate people debate passionately. So I am definitely in favor of that. I appreciate you guys. Candor, demeanor. Oh, it got a little spicy, but it's OK. You guys got it, man. I appreciate you guys so much. And I look forward to perhaps doing this again sometime. Maybe not with you two, but maybe breaking it up a little bit and uh, getting you guys on with a different opponent or just an open discussion would be great as well. Uh, would you guys happen to have any uh, closing words before I let you guys go? Dr. Brown? Yeah, so so let's let's just close on on, on the common ground that we have that a true believer will live like a believer. And if if you're out there saying, well, I'm saved because Jesus died for me and I can live however in the world I want to live, that's not the gospel. And both of us agree on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I believe that, uh, and this is, I think this needs to be stated no matter what we're talking about, no matter what, if we're talking about eternal security, if we're talking about the tribulation, if we're talking about tongues, whatever we're talking about, the most important thing that we should always remember uh, to put out that if you don't know Jesus, if you have not had a relationship with him, whether you believe you can lose your salvation or not, once saved, always saved or not, the question is, do you have Jesus? Make sure, place your faith in what he's done on the cross because of his love, and then make this argument because of how you're living a moot point. Amen. 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 All right, guys. Thank you so much. And, uh, let you guys go. You guys take care and God bless. All right. Thank God you. God bless. Thanks so much. All right. Another great debate in the books, guys. And once again, I know a lot of people out there. What about my question? What about my question? You know, with these big debates like this, I think we had about three. I think we topped off at about 360, uh, 360 something people watching that one time. This is one of the larger debates I've had on this platform. I think the only debate that probably trumped this one are two of them. And I think one was the Matt Slick, Sam Shimon one. And I can't remember the other one, but this is one of the more larger debates. And typically even with over a hundred people in the live chat, you know, a lot of people are more probable to give super chats. And because of that, you know, super chats get priority. And so a lot of the questions, though they're good questions, I'm reading every question, they're good questions. Um, I can't undercut people who are actually uh, giving funds to have their questions asked. So uh, please forgive me uh, for not getting your question. I will try to get them next time. I, I do desire to get those questions in, um, but once again, it, it, I, I don't wanna undercut the people who are, who are you know, uh, giving funds their money to support the ministry to ask a question. So, uh, but yeah, I thank you guys for the support and I appreciate all you guys uh, for showing up. I know a lot of people on here are fans of uh, Dr. Brown and fans of Corey. And I appreciate you guys for the most part, keeping it civil in the, uh, in the live chat. You know, I don't have a whole bunch of moderators. I think I have Slam uh, who was in there. And I think I had, um, What's his name? Uh, Truth, uh, where is he at? Uh, I have one more moderator and I can't remember who else I saw in here. But nonetheless, I don't have a lot of moderators in that chat, especially with, for debates like this. Uh, so I definitely thank you for helping the moderators and myself keep control of the live chat by you guys maintaining civil behavior. Definitely appreciate that. Um, also, there was a, a super chat that was given uh, but the question was rather, I, I would interpret it as being rude. Um, 
Uh, and you know, when we when, when you, you you desire to spend your own money for a super chat, and you say, you know, I'm gonna sort the ministry. Uh, no matter the value, you know, let's make the question count because if the question comes off rude and brash, even if it's a super chat, I won't ask it, right? Um, I think that's only happened one time, one other time uh, during the time I've been hosting debates. Uh, Truth Defender, that's my other moderator. That's who it is, Truth Defender. Uh, but that's this has only happened one other time where someone was given a super chat and I saw the question, I thought it was very rude, a very rude question. It was un, uh, demeaning the... The, one of the debate opponents, and I'm not going to ask that question. Uh, that's not what they're here for, to be uh, disrespected. So people will try to throw it as a super chat, you know, and try to give me the answer to the question. Ask the question because it's a super chat, right? And, th and that's not how I roll. So if you want to waste your money and you want to, and, and you want to uh, send super chats, right? And you want to be sent super chats and be rude to the debaters, that's your fault. And the question won't get asked even if it's on super chat. So... Just forewarning anyone out there who decides, you know, I'm gonna give a super, I'm gonna support Marlon and the, the gospel truth. Um, just make sure your question is geared towards the topic matter and it's not rude, right? It's not rude. Let's not be rude to people, you know? Um, if you have a contention with one of the debaters, then you you take that question and you email that to the, uh, to the, um, to the, the person that question's for. Right, but that's not gonna fly on here. I'm not gonna allow you guys to be rude to uh, the debaters. You know, they take time after eat their schedule. Uh, they take time after schedule for this, right? And it, it, it's becoming, it, 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 you have to be respectful to these guys, right? Even if you disagree with them, all right? Uh, also, uh, people are asking me about my thoughts on this, right? Uh, I had a question here uh from the least of these well i'm a calvinist so i hold to perseverance of the saints i'm a five-point ironclad rigid calvinist right <laughs> uh so i hold to perseverance of the saints so i disagree with once saved always saved and i do disagree obviously with uh, the idea you can lose your salvation if you walk away or turn away from christ um i think that perseverance of the saints uh they understand the perseverance uh, perseverance other saints teaches that those who believe in Christ will persevere till the end, but it's not by anything that we do It's by God holding us in the faith It's by Christ holding us in the faith and it's by his total and complete work on the cross, the atoning work on the cross that he has uh, 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 eliminated the debt that was our sin. And because of that, he holds the power of death in his hand and he will cause his saints to persevere till the end so that is my position on uh on this this conversation uh, another thing i think we should really take into consideration when we're talking about this this is this is this this is a topic matter that should really drive home our sanctification right when we begin to talk about salvation like salvation is the is the epicenter of the Christian faith, right? Anybody who studied Christian apologetics, right? Anybody who studied Christian apologetics for any length of time, um, have the understanding and know that the only worldview, the Christian worldview is the only worldview that you don't have to work into salvation, right? You don't have to work your way into salvation. Christianity is the only worldview that says that someone satisfied the wrath of God, right? Jesus Christ and atoned for our sins and saved us, right? Christianity is the only one. All the other worldviews, all the other uh, religions out there teach a work-based salvation, right? Christianity is the only one that teaches a non-work salvation, work-based salvation, right? So we should look at this conversation like once saved, always saved, you know, perseverance of the saints, things like that we should really zero in on these type of topics and say, you know what, if there's any debate topic that really drives home the understanding of how we live our lives in the face of our salvation, in the face of Christ calling us out our sin, um, it's this topic that does that, right? It's this topic that causes us to say, you know what, how am I living, right? Not that your work, obviously, your works don't save you, right? But it, there, it's always this inter, 
penetration within your own heart, so to speak, um, that, that, that when these type of conversations come up, you're like, man, okay, let me take a step. Maybe, maybe I can, you know, maybe I can do this better. Maybe I can look at myself in the mirror and say, where have I erred? You know what I mean? Can I walk in my sanctification better? Right? Remember, sanctification is a synergistic work between the, 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 the believer and, and God, right? The working of the Holy Spirit in your heart, right? So there is this understanding, right? That we need to work in our salvation. You know, Paul the Apostle says that we should work on our soul salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your soul own salvation, soul salvation, and fear and trembling, right? So this is the idea of synergistically working out your salvation. Not that you're being saved, but that you're working within your heart, right? You're changing those things that are causing you, right? That are causing you to stumble. You're changing those things that are causing you not to draw closer to Christ, but it's causing you to distance yourself from Christ, right? So if there, once again, if there's any topic that causes you to make you ponder those thoughts of, uh, of how we are living in our Christian walk. I think this kind of conversation does this, right? And this, and this, and this goes to, this goes to, you know, what good are debates, right? Debates just see people arguing and debating all the time. Debates don't do anything but keep people arguing it's senseless debating. That's what a lot of people would say, people who don't appreciate debate. But I think debates have a way of not only preaching the gospel to those who are debate, those individuals who are debating who don't believe in Christ, but you, you're preaching the gospel through debating, right? The gospel is the meat. Your arguments are the seasoning on the meat, right? I, th I, I, I think that this is where debates hit the road and they go. They're, 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 they're not just spinning wheels. They're burning rubber and they're going, right? They're shooting down the road because debates have a, th these type of debates are extremely meaningful, right? Uh, they really bring forth the scriptures to see, to, to do an inner inspection of ourselves, right? So all in all, it is important for us to always be in, uh, inspecting ourselves to see what we are doing. Um, obviously, I'm one. I think Christ, there's no one that can snatch, snatch us out of God's hands. You know, read that over in John chapter 10. I think, you know, Christ is a good shepherd. You know, all of this, you know, I think, uh, but I think there's this level of, uh, of, of inspection that we need to take. And I think if we do this consistently, consistently, in, in inspecting us, I think we will be uh, doing just fine, right? Our salvation is in Christ, but there is nothing wrong with doing the inner inspection uh, of ourselves, right? Inner inspection of ourselves. And I think that's extremely, extremely helpful here. And Slam, you send a question. I'm going to take this question. I'm going to get off here. Uh, question is, uh, the question is really is faith works? It is, right? That is, that is the, that's the real question there, right? Is faith a form of works? Right? That, that is extreme. That's an extremely important question that one might ask. Is faith a work? And from a Calvinist position, you know, it, we believe that faith is a gift from God, right? By you exercising Faith, that is a salvific faith, right? That is a gift from God. And so it is a work of God doing it in your heart. That's from a Calvinistic perspective. But that is that is really uh, the real question, right? I'll let you guys figure that one out for yourself. But that is the real question that's being asked here. Um, and I think that, I think Slam, you definitely brought up a good point here with that. Um, so... All in all, you know, I definitely appreciate um, you guys and I appreciate you guys uh, continue to submit ministry and support. And um, you guys uh, stay safe out there. Be blessed, man. There's a lot of craziness going on. Uh, you know, uh, stay away from the submarines, right? Stay away from the submarines. Don't be uh, jumping the submarines and going 13,000 feet under the water. Uh, 13,000 yards, I don't know, what are they, feet? 13,000 feet or yards or something like that? Don't do that. Um, 
it's unfortunate uh, what happened to those individuals. Uh, continue to keep that, them, that those families in prayer. Um, that had to be the most ridiculous thing that I, you know, outside of everything else. Everything is crazy. So just stay prayed up, stay encouraged, and stay in faith, right? Stay in faith. And believe, keep believing on Christ, man. Don't give up, all right? That said, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to enjoy the rest of my evening. And you guys uh, continue to hold it down, man. I'll be back next week for another fantastic debate. So I hope you guys be safe out there. Be blessed. And once again, if you have yet to do so, make sure you subscribe to The Gospel Truth. Hit that notification, notification bell before you leave. Hey, before you leave this channel, hit that subscribe button. If this debate was a blessing for you, there's a whole bunch of other debates that's going to be a blessing to you as well. You don't want to miss out. So hit that subscribe, all right? You guys take care and God bless.